Yeah, so the start of it, um, of, of Xenophon's analysis, it just starts, doesn't it? It just opens. There's yeah. no sort of introductory, there's no sort of special, like Herodotus and Thucydides both sort of go into some detail about what they're going to do and what they're going to talk about. And, and there's none of that. And it he must d- be deliberate. Just... Yeah, it, it, well, I, I find it very interesting how he just lays he just lays out the political landscape of the conflict between Cyrus the Younger and Artaxerxes, um, and how he just prepares the he prepares a, a secret army because he was a lover of the Greeks and he thought they were fine warriors and whatnot, and <laughs> and he was going to go to war with his brother at some point, probably under yeah. the favor of his mother. Yeah, well, like the the opening line is like sort of if you're like uh, into ancient history or the ancient historians, the opening line is sort of a famous one. It just states that that the that the old king Darius and his wife just had two sons, Artaxerxes and Cyrus. It just it just starts like that, and yeah. um, and and the actual sort of literary criticism of it um, say that you know that must have been deliberate. It, it, that's. It, it, it's not by accident that he doesn't set himself up or say, I'm Xenophon, I took part in this, or anything like that. He, he just leads you in as though it's uh, like a really authoritative statement of historical fact when, it, you know, we realise in the end that it's something a bit more than that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, it makes his narrative very trustworthy sounding, hmm. as if you can you can rely on what he's going to say. And the thing is, I don't, I don't get the sense from him that he's trying to lie either. It's not like he doesn't talk about when the Greeks suffer reverses or have in in how you know inward bickering and things like this. So it's not like he he presents them as like perfect or anything like that. You know, uh, I mean, in his, uh, jumping ahead a lot, but in in his speech, he to rouse them all up. I mean, it's you know, it, it it's not that they've been doing great. In fact, they should come on pick themselves up and we should go and do something because otherwise we're all going to get killed because they're falling into depression, you know? So they're not just yeah. glorious Uberman who are marching on the evil Persian, you know, because people, people think, um, now because the Persians ended up getting conquered by Alexander, that the Greeks at the time didn't have this awe inspiring vision of them. Like the Persians were a terrifying thing for mm. generations mm. to the Greeks, you know, and people like they they were a massively powerful force. Like looking back at it now, we know the results, but they didn't know what the results were gonna be. So they, they had a lot of respect for the Persians. Yeah, I mean, well that empire it stretched from like <laughs> Egypt to India, from like the Caucasus to the Arabian Gulf and was yeah. endlessly rich. It, you know, look all the different sources. So they just had endless men, endless horses, endless yeah. money. <laughs> and, Absolutely. And I mean of course the Greek states were still pretty fractious. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look, just look on a map of the Persian Empire and then just compare it to the size of Greece. Like, if if any of the numbers were anything like it, at least they're ascribing the you know the millions that turned up to Greece from the Persian Empire. At least, at least they're ascribing it to an entity that could have provided millions. Like, mm. it it's not like that. I I remember seeing a, a you know some study years ago about how they there was estimated fifty six million people in the Persian Empire. It's like Jesus. Oh, right. That is a that, for the time. That is huge. And then Greece, probably one or two million at the most. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, it's one of those things. When you step back and look at it, you think it's probably too big. Really, you know, the, yeah. the, these empires reach that limit, um, especially in the ancient world, where it just becomes very difficult to. Well, it's like a melting pot, isn't it? Well, when Alexander does eventually beat them, it's got those big couple of big battles, this and stuff. It's because, well, one of the reasons they say, isn't it, is that they're mm. they're just a an amalgam of lots of people that don't necessarily actually hold together that firmly because it's so huge. The empire is yeah. so huge, but and the, the, this yeah. is interesting how the Anabasis is the precursor to essentially to what Alexander did as well. Um, th- yeah. This this is what taught the Greeks that hang on, the Persian Empire is effectively hollow because <laughs> that's what the problem was. Because when you when you, when you march into a territory, the uh, only the king's guard or the you know unless they unless it's like a people who think you're about to sack them or something. But even then, you're going to get not much in the way of resistance. You know, it's the royal armies that have the real weaponry and the real training. So, you know, it's but if if they're not around, then it's pretty much open. And that's what yeah, they learned. Yeah, it's interesting from. you say it was hollow. Yeah. So from like a tactical perspective, this is I'm pretty sure that if I recall correctly, that this is one of the reasons that Philip of Macedon was so interested in Persia. He thought that he could break the Persians at a few big battles and then take the lot, or at least, you know, half of it or something. Philip of Macedon would have would have actually accepted the half and half deal that Alexander was offered, I reckon. Mm. I, I reckon he's a, a 
total pragmatist, <laughs> and he totally would have gone for it. Um, yeah. But anyway, sorry. Let's let's carry on yeah. with the analysis. Yeah, I was just going to say, and another thing that I suppose Philip and Alexander and all their gen, all those Macedonian generals, of two or three generations after this, um, or two generations, uh, not only that you could march in, it was sort of hollow, um, but the a Greek phalanx kick the shit out of almost anything Persia could, you know, yes. throw against them. Um, um, but yeah, yeah we're getting ahead a bit of ourselves slightly. We, uh, we are, but the, yeah, it, it, it's down to the different kinds of warfare and the yeah. different environments. But uh, anyway, so Karen. Uh, so, it, well, so it just starts with basically the fact that Cyrus, the younger of the, of the two brothers, or well, the old king Darius dies and his older brother Artaxerxes II takes the throne legitimately. And uh, actually, is it, uh, it's, I think it might be Tissaphernes who sort of whispers in the ear of Artaxerxes that his, his brother Cyrus is uh, going to plot against him, so you better arrest him. And, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but it wouldn't be surprise me at all, given the sort of... And it's not... And it, even You see this in the Peloponnesian War as well. Tissaphernes is a proper little schemer. Mm. Yeah, worm-tongue type. Yeah, yeah, yeah he really is. Mm. I, I really had a disliking for Tissaphernes after, after reading this. <laughs> and uh, and but so he gets that's away why it's pro Greek propaganda, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not I'm not reading Tissaphernes' account of it, am I? <laughs> no, there's not. Um, yeah, he he always comes across as a, a villain. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's like pre- a pretty straightforward, almost sort of two dimensional villain. Um, but I mean, well, that's the way it is. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I mean, he probably was someone who didn't like the Greeks, but that probably means that the Greek caricature over him that we have is probably not as accurate as mm. we would need it to be to make a real character judgment. Mm. But he does seem mm. like a shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but Cyrus gets away from sort of the clutches um, of, his, of his brother that first instance because the, the mum apparently uh, favours him yeah. and sort of she sort of gets him released. But Cyrus sort of vows, at least to himself, that he will never allow himself to be under the sway of his brother ever again. Un- under his brother's power in the translation. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Yeah. His brother couldn't be trusted to treat him fairly. Yeah, well, there's a long tradition of Persian sort of uh, royal families murdering each other. I mean, it's all royal families, lot. to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's all of them. I think in. The... Oh, sorry, go on. Well, yeah, that's just that's just the nature of like absolute hereditary monarchies. You know, family members end up having to kill each other. Yeah, I think it's like uh, some of like the the Ottoman sultans and some of the sort of Persian dynasties. They would sometimes a new uh, ruler would get to the throne, and he might have many, many, even dozens of sort of uh, brothers and cousins, and he'd have them all murdered. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, no, ironically. <laughs> like th- this, this is what Machiavelli talks about in The Prince. It's like, well, each each uh, member of the family who had a legitimate claim to the throne becomes a rallying point around which dissent can coalesce. And mm-hmm. that'll end up toppling your reign. And it's bad for the kingdom because it's not good to be in a state of perpetual civil war. So you actually have an ethical duty, according to Machiavelli, to kill the family of a rival prince. Um, <laughs> this is why hereditary monarchy is a bad idea, by the way. Much better to vote them out. <laughs> I mean, it's your duty to murder your distant relatives. <laughs> well, otherwise you're bringing to civil war. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, even in like Henry VIII was like hunting down little yeah. old ladies that were like yeah. vaguely connected to the old... The, the princes in the tower. You know, everyone's like, oh, it's the mystery. No, they were murdered. Okay, <laughs> It's like there was only one option. Oh, there's no question in my mind they were they were smut they were killed yeah murdered absolutely yeah yeah <laughs> but sorry yeah um, we're going off on yeah so. yeah um, so anyway Cyrus decides that he if he strikes quickly and decisively um, against against his his brother he could he could topple him and install himself and um, and that's sort of the prudent thing to do um, and so to uh, one of the things one of the contingents of the army he puts together is, is some Greeks. Um, and th- there's sort of uh, five main factions. There's some Spartans, some Archaeans, and uh, so all sorts of different ones, actually. Uh, yeah. But because because Cyrus's sort of thief, if you like, was uh, in in the far west, sort of in the in the Greek, almost in the Greek world, very west of, uh, of yeah, modern Turkey. Well, he he the the Ionians were disputed between like him and Tissaphernes or something, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and so it actively involved Greeks. Um, and he was a, also a Phil Hellene. He he thought that he he thought really highly of the Greeks. Um, yeah. He was specifically trying to recruit from the Peloponnese, uh, obviously trying to get Spartans or uh, Perioikoi. Um, so yeah, like the, he he specifically valued them as heavy infantry. 
Yeah, and they were, as we already said, the, the, the phalanx, or well, the hoplites are the heavy infantry, aren't they? and the peltasts are the light infantry, and both are, are just really, really good. Um, so, well, in no, uh, sorry, go before on. we before we move on from them, that that's a really good point. You say really, really good, and it's it's important to note that, like, in in most ancient warfare, um, being really good means being steadfast. Because when, when two armies come to blows, when you're wearing a lot of armor, there's actually not a lot of death that goes on on the front lines. Um, we, you can see this by when, a, when an army routes, um, you'll see the casualties on one side are very, very low because it's the running away that gets everyone killed, which I'm sure everyone listening to this knows. Um, but, but this is the question. It's like, why, why were the Greeks so much more willing to engage? than like Because, I mean, if you've got 50,000 Persian spearmen if they form a solid phalanx and a, you know the the depth of it is could just surely just push the greeks back and uh, you know out of formation so they can be killed you know so it's like why why were the greeks so ready to stand there and i, th- I the the thought is obviously because they're free men and not slaves that's the historic yeah. sort of interpretation of it um i don't know whether that's true or not but it's certainly romantic isn't it <laughs> yeah absolutely that is a diff- that is a tough question a sort of a perennial thing that i think a lot, all historians ask like why did this army stand its ground and this one not yeah. um and i think the answer to that is actually that if every day in history is sort of a unique thing and um <laughs> and it comes down to just a multitude a plethora of reasons mm. Um, uh, but a lot of them are sort of ingrained cultural things. Um, mm, mm. Uh, I remember Dan Carlin once talking about uh, talking about World War One, the, the blueprint blueprint for Armageddon, where he mm. talked about you couldn't do that again. You couldn't get tens of thousands of men to sort of line up in trenches and charge each other. It, it, that was sort of a moment in time, you know. Yeah. And yeah. and I think this is I think this is no different. That the the Greeks of um, Xenophon and and Pericles' generations, that sort of era. There was, you know, it's a, it's a moment in time and it's, it's difficult to put your finger on exactly why they were so great as a phalanx. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the fact that, I mean, that obviously I'm sure like faith in the weaponry and stuff would do it. And certainly mm-hmm. they're contributing, uh, you know, they were better armed and armored and probably better, probably better trained in many regards because Greece had just been at war for like 30 years or something. So yeah, yeah. You know, yeah you know, they're all veterans, basically. Yeah, well, yeah, they are. Yeah, they're all veterans. They're all mercenaries. You know, so these are these are not like, you know, these are not new recruits or anything. These are people who have been fighting for years. So it's no wonder that Cyrus is like, well, these guys now to fight. Yeah, and there's the great Homeric yeah. tradition as well that you were probably brought up from the earliest age, certainly yes. if he was aristocratic, to yes. try and emulate. Achilles, pretty much as simple as that. <laughs> no, that's a fantastic point. Um, yeah, the the thing, the things that civilizations value is something I find very fascinating, and it is interesting how like that kind of heroism is actually valued by the Greeks. That's something to aspire to. I mean, you you see this um, in like the, the you know like stories of people being reckless on the front lines and you know trying mm. to you know do the same thing as Achilles and, and Hercules and all that. And it's like. These people are mental. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're pretty gung ho. I mean, it's it's great stuff. It's sort of boy's yeah. own stuff, isn't it? I mean, it the, really the, is. Yeah, it's, just, <laughs> I mean, it's just a great adventure story. It's like deep behind enemy lines. Uh, yeah. I hesitate to mention Bravo Two Zero, but um, <laughs> you know, escape and invasion on the grandest scale. You know. Yeah, it's it's it really is a heroic story. But anyway, should we? So yeah, yeah. so, so, so Cyrus. Yeah, one oh, of the main things I think you've got to point out is that, um, or, well, that Xenophon goes to great uh, stress to say is that the Greeks didn't think they were going to topple Artaxerxes. They didn't think they were marching <laughs> to Babylon to topple the king of Persia. Yes. They were told, apparently, uh, that they were just going on um, sort of in, in terms of the Pisidian people, the Pisidians in sort of yeah. southern Anatolia, to just sort of put them down for a summer, and that would be it. And so it, it's it's actually quite important to sort of the meta narrative or the grander story of Xenophon's life that he makes it clear to the reader who originally would have been Athenians of his age, that he didn't know what he was, what he was supposed to be doing. Yeah, absolutely correct. Um, like it's been, it's been years since I've read it, but I read it a lot when I did, I must've, there was an audiobook of this on, uh, on YouTube actually from LibriVox. So it wasn't brilliantly recorded, but I didn't care at the time, you know, um, mm-hmm. 
and I must have listened to it about half a dozen times, maybe more. Um, but I can't remember the reason. Of, was it not just Cyrus being charming and persuasive to the Greeks that does it? Oh, that turns them round when they realise that that's what's yeah, happening. Yeah, that persuades them to carry on, yeah. Yeah, that's part of it. The other thing is one of the, the like the overall general, although it's disputed, but there's a Spartan general, is it Clearchus? Um, yeah. He tries to just whip, well, not physically, but just whip them into line, just say, look, you're doing it. This is what's happening now. And they sort of refuse. And then there's a passage, he says, he goes before them and just stands there in silence and starts weeping. And <laughs> <laughs> and all these hardened warriors, these hardened Spartan soldiers all sort of stop and like, as one think okay this is weird this is something odd um <laughs> and anyway yeah basically just a, a few uh persuasive speeches by like the top brass uh, yeah. turn them around and of course there is i mean uh, the the reality of that if you if you win you're going to have untold riches <laughs> yeah that that's that's also a very persuasive factor i imagine which but, i mean like already a mercenary army i mean i mean that's it's great but the the thing is, imagine that being your job. Like your 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 job as a mercenary, so you you're constantly just walking from city to city, putting down revolts. Right, that's most of your job. Occasionally, some will invade you, and you know, you'll 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 fight a, a big pitch battle, or occasionally you'll get into a long siege. Fine, but like, you don't think right now we're going to go topple. We're going to walk a thousand miles to topple the capital of the largest empire that's ever existed. Like that's that's today's job. You might, I mean, I can see why there was resistance to this on part on the part of the Greeks, and throughout the narrative, um, Cyrus is portrayed as a very charming man, um, and lots of different types of people find him so. Um, mm. So it's interesting how I mean the way it's described is odd, but that's obviously our cultural differences. This was obviously very persuasive to the Greeks. Yeah, Xenophon's a, a big fan uh, he, yeah. uh, of the Persians in general and the Spartans. Uh, but he, yeah, he goes to he says Cyrus is a great, great guy. Everyone loved him from childhood, yeah. and he was. But not only that, he's an exemplary leader. He would yeah. have made a great, great ruler of Persia. What a shame that he's and sort you, of doomed. You can you can see this in the way that he talks about how he pays his men. He always overpays. He like when when I can't remember which one it was somewhere somewhere in Thrace or somewhere. Um, Someone had come to him for two thousand uh, enough, you know, three months pay for two thousand mercenaries, and he gives him six months for four thousand, um, yeah. or something like that, you know. And yeah. then that when they, I think it's probably after the Pisidians, uh, where they're marching through, or maybe it's just before, but the men haven't been paid, and and he makes a note of saying this was unusual because normally Cyrus is a very eager paying guy, you know, so he, he paid his bills, you know, so it's all a very good character build it like a building up of the character that you get to see not just from what he says but also what he does and it, it gives you a really nice impression that okay cyrus is actually a decent chap and like you say he would actually have been a good ruler yeah no absolutely and i think uh if you were a mercenary in in the, the greek contingent of this army and you realize what's happening you're going to be forced to or you're being asked to march to babylon um you might have some uh like forebodings about it but it's also the greatest payday Ever, it's also like I would have imagined a lot of them are like, oh, okay, now this is sort of the the chance of a lifetime. Um, yeah, uh, you know, a normal plunderer might get uh, some rugs, a few oxen, and maybe a silver goblet or something. But now I look at maybe endless riches or like lands of my own or you know things like that. And you'll notice that when when they actually get to Canaxa, uh, they don't enter it with a heavy heart. They uh, they are laughing and and jeering at the Persians that like and when they split the Exactly, you know, they're they're actually in really fucking high spirits. But I don't want to let's let's not get ahead of ourselves. But the 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 point is, Cyrus must have been a very persuasive guy, and they must have just come from the kind of heroic culture that was adventurous, because a lot of it is told like an adventure. The march down into ba into um to book to Babylon is just literally just a fun adventure story, like bros helping each other out when the the Persian nobles yeah. start pulling the carts out of the mud and stuff, you know, and they go hunting <laughs> for ostriches. Sorry, I know I'm getting ahead, but like. Sorry, it's it's yeah. it's told like a bro story, and so it's you know you don't expect necessarily the hardships in the second half. But sorry, yeah, no, that's a really good point. That gets to something again, sort of the sort of a uh, bit more serious literary analysis of it. That that the narrator is Xenophon, but he's also a character in it as well. Yes. So it's it, it's actually something that's a little bit complicated, and and the book starts without it making it clear at all. As we say, it just starts. Well, he's not it? mentioned there's, there's until no he wakes up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's not mentioned at all until then. Like, 
he comes to the point where he actually begins his involvement in the story, which is then the story. So essentially he's telling a history up until about, I don't know, halfway through or so. And then it's what Xenophon does, you know? Yeah, it turns from a, a, a standard history, sort of a, a novel-esque autobiography, <laughs> or like yeah, a, a memoir, or like a sort of yeah. flattering memoir. But he was present at all of these events, basically. So, <sighs> you know, we can, I mean, it's as good an account as we're going to get. Yeah, and, and as you say, it's just a, a great few. Like, sometimes the narrative skips ahead quite quickly, doesn't it? Like, we mm. say, oh, and then the next day we just marched for, for, yeah. for 14 miles, and then the next three days we covered 60 miles, and it doesn't really really give any detail and then there'll be sort yeah. of a, a hint of something really specific that happens but i tell you anyone who's ever done any kind of traveling significantly knows that there are long periods of time where absolutely nothing of significance happens <laughs> so you know yeah. why would you include it yeah and and they they cross through deserts and go over yeah. uh, uh, all sorts of rivers it, it's made clear that the terrain is fairly difficult even though they've got basically free passage no one's contesting no one's contesting Cyrus because oh, the other thing to make clear is Cyrus has got a huge sort of Persian army of which yeah. the Greek, these 10,000 Greeks, are a relatively small part. I mean, in, in, in the, the Battle of Canaxa that comes up, they take on, it's not even entirely clear, but they take on one wing. Uh, but I don't even think it's... They're in, they're it's in the center, there. if I recall correct, correctly. I thought, that, I thought they were in the center. Um, no, I, I, well, yeah. I guess I got it wrong. Um, no, they have, um, I'm a, I must the, have it wrong. The, the king, the Persian king's in his center and right. uh, Cyrus oh, right, is right. in his center and they clash. Right. Um, and, and, okay. and the, the Greeks push their wing, they completely successful on their wing. Mm. And well, let's, push. let's not get into it. Yeah. It's my bad memory. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's the hardships of, of just getting through the terrain and, um, and all the, that sort of thing, and some quarrels between the top generals. Yeah, as there always are. Because pe people have got to remember that Greek armies are led by ten generals. Yeah, it seems funny that this... The, it must have been more complex than this, but what you get from Xenophon... Why an even number? Three, uh, uh, yeah, three so ranks. There's like... Um, uh, there's a the strategist, the, the generals at the top. There's captains, and then there's just everyone else. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So um, the what I find I, I really find it interesting the um, the description of the wildlife as they're marching into Persia, um, like the fact there are ostriches in Me in Mesopotamia at that time, things like this. Like yeah. it's, I found that I just found that really interesting, you know. And obviously, at some point in the last however many thousand years, they've disappeared. <laughs> Yeah, there's loads of little weird, sort of really quirky little details about things. Like, what, what is that about? Like, at one point, I don't know, just off the top of my head, he's talking about um, uh, some palm trees, and you can cut the cabbage out of the middle of the palm tree and eat that. And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> it's really good, though, isn't it? Because it, yeah, it gives yeah, it's you... fascinating. Well, yeah, I know, but it 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 makes you realise that like the past is a foreign country. You mm -hmm. know that that is really true. They do, you know, things are different there, and they do things different there. And like the, I mean, I found the, the, the Persian nobles leaping into the mud to pull the cart out of the mud, a very interesting story as well. Cause I assume that the reason Xenophon made note of it was because they were nobles, you know, that maybe, that maybe they'd try and get their servants to do it or something like that. And it was a, mm -hmm. it was a test of like manhood for them to get in and do it. So it was a very competitive atmosphere. And I Ooh. find that very interesting because often we're, we're led to believe by the, the data, I suppose, the numbers that the Persians were not like, you know, great warriors, which I think they probably were, you know, and mm -hmm. I mean, they were professionals after all. So yeah. they had conquered the rest of the world, you know, so, you know, I'm sure that there were some great warriors and, and, and the Greeks always speak very highly generally of the Persian aristocrats and their fighting capabilities. So I, like, I've, you know, I've seen this multiple times. So I found that interesting. Yeah, they must have been really good. If 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 the Medes destroyed the Assyrians and the Persians destroyed the Medes, um, yeah, there's no question that they were good at what they were doing. But of course, we've just got the pretty much the slanted uh, Hellenistic yeah. Greek version of everything, haven't we? Really? Well, that's uh, that's the, what I mean, though. It's it's you know the, per, the the Greeks don't seem to actually disrespect the Persians from my experience of reading Greek accounts of the Persians. Mm. Like they. They totally respect the strength of the Persians, man. They're like a giant evil empire that's going <laughs> to crush them all. You know, they know that the Persians are terrifying. That's why what they did was heroic. You 
Yeah, that's quite a, a thing that runs through sort of more s- the civilized people is that when when you defeat someone, you sort of do give them credit the way the, the Romans gave the Germans just so much credit. Tacitus talks about yeah. the Germans glowingly, um, or the way we sort of, in, in some sense, uh, glorify the Nazis. How many films and documentaries get made out of the Nazis? Most people that LARP as World War II want to be Nazis, you know. Um, yeah, there are definitely. <laughs> it's these an interesting. People. Yeah, it's you know, just they, an interesting psychological thing that the people that n- nearly defeated you or were your bitterest enemies, you actually give them loads of respect. Well, I think it makes sense to recognise the virtues in your opponent because then you you're not unprepared for them. Mm. You know, if you don't re- if you don't respect those things, they can hurt you. You know, so they you know they can affect whatever it is you're competing for because that's that's how they're trying to win. So you've got to you've got to understand those things in a sort of competitive sense like that. So yeah. I, I think it makes complete sense, but you're right. It's, it's a much, it's a very sort of civilized way to look at it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So when Cyrus and the Greek army rock up to well near Babylon, um, the the you know the king. It's, it's interesting, really, and, and Xenophon doesn't go into detail about it. Why they're not sort of contested before they get right up to you know, a day's march from Babylon, but that's seemingly just what happens. Well, we can probably explain that with um, Artaxerxes being taken by surprise and taking time to gather an army. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. He ha- by, when they do eventually meet, Artaxerxes has gathered a massive army. So, yeah, yeah there, there's just that whole side of it, which Xenophon doesn't really tell us about. Uh, well, he didn't Bernie see it, did has he? got a huge... Sorry? He didn't see it, did he? Well, yeah, right, yeah. But, but yeah. There's, no, there's no question that, like, uh, in, the, in the beginning, uh, Xenophon goes to great lengths to explain how the mercenary groups that Cyrus was getting together were basically secret. And they were, you know, he was using like, oh, we're putting down revolts here to as an excuse to hold mercenary companies in hmm. service, uh, but not really do anything giant with them. And then this this attack on the Pisidians is a sort of pretext to start using those. And then, so from from Artaxerxes' position, Cyrus has taken ten thousand mercenaries to go smack the Pisidians. Okay, hmm. great, go smack the Pisidians. I don't care. Hmm. You know, th- this all keeps. He's got problems on like the eastern borders and the north, you know, and all this sort of stuff. You know, and so this is this is a surprise to Artaxerxes, probably that it actually comes to this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, well, it's certainly um, Cyrus's sort of stated claim to sort of strike while the iron is hot. You know, to the the the, yeah. the element of surprise and yeah, while well, he has that, the advantage. That, yeah, yeah, and it certainly seems to have worked up to like the moment of engagement. Um, and, <laughs> should we uh, should we get to the moment of engagement? Yeah, well, it, yeah. So it seems like at first the king, the Artaxerxes, has got a much bigger army just in sheer terms of volume um yeah. much much bigger but he's um he's not really prepared to engage right away he seems a bit skittish about it um yeah. and he's got oh, he's got all sorts he's got egyptian chariots uh with the scythed chariots and uh yeah people from all over well the the, the middle east i suppose well, yes yeah, uh, and, and africa and africa you know, he's he's got troops from literally the entire empire yeah, yeah, it's it's a really good, it's a great picture um, that Xenophon paints of it. It's very diverse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is a very diverse picture. You got to give him that. But to me, in in Cyrus's defense, he also has a very diverse army as well. His army's also, you know, from the empire. Because, like you say, like the the numbers they quote are something like two hundred and four hundred thousand on either on one side and the other, right? And yeah. that's obviously way too much. Yeah. Like I could believe ten thousand Greeks or thirteen thousand, at least initially. Like that's not a giant number, although that is a big number. The Persian Empire is massive and has loads of money. You know, the numbers presented are feasible. You know, um, mm. but the 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 then sort of like hundred and ninety odd thousand Persians, that seems ridiculous. With all these ancient sources, you've got to be extremely careful with the numbers they say. And modern yeah. historians are, you know, it's rare that a modern historian doesn't mention that they say, oh, these numbers are inflated, of course. <laughs> of course. They, or, or, but the, the thing is, right, I, I've always, I've got a bunch of counter arguments to that that I annoy me and I don't necessarily agree with. Because I think that reasonably, yeah, these numbers are bound to be inflated, right? And almost all of the numbers probably are uh, for narrative purposes to remember these things, right? But then, I, well, the Persian quartermaster surely knows how many men they've got, you know. And so, like, the Persian king will surely know how many men they've got because they're feeding them, you know. That's a, that's a calculation they can make, you know, and have to make. How much how much food they're going to have for X amount of time for X food per mouth, you know. Um, yeah. And then you listen in, um, oh, God, what was, wh- whichever one it was that was, 
the Persian invasion of Greece. And you hear how Cyrus is measuring out his men. They, they count 10,000 people to stand in a block and then just draw around that block and then just get people to fill the block, right? If you were going to count, that's actually quite an accurate way of counting hundreds of thousands of men. Like, you might be yeah. like four or five out on each block or something, or maybe 20 or 30, but if you're counting blocks of 10,000, you've still got a relatively good rough estimate. And if they come out with however many million, I'm sat there thinking, well, I mean, they're not idiots, you know? They're not stupid. They have to feed these people. They have to pay these people. They have to, you know, actually account for these people. And the Persians were, you know, perfectly fine bureaucrats. You know, mm. they, they, they had yeah. no problem man maneuvering huge amounts of resources. And then we sit there from like 2,000 years distance and go, no, 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 no. That, mu that must be inflated. That must be inflated. <laughs> it's, it seems terribly arrogant. And like, I mean, they, they really think, I really think they might have actually known like m more accurately than we're giving them credit for. Like, I think we're assuming more knowledge than we really had when they had literally direct knowledge and the people in front of them, like, <laughs> you know, we're assuming they're fucking idiots. That's, yeah, that's my defense point. of ancient inflated numbers. <laughs> that's a fair point. And I think, I think like the, the, the Persians or anyone who is barbaric, according to the Greco Roman world, suffer from that even more, you know, yeah, but it wasn't, they... it wasn't, it wasn't dismissive when used when, with the Persians, it was just used as a, an, you know, they're not us, they're not Greeks now with the, you know, cause I don't, I don't think it was as um, condescending as people make out either. Cause I mean, again, they, it's not like they don't respect virtues about the barbarians either. Like, mm -hmm. but you know, when they, you know, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think it's like calling people, a, someone a foreigner. You know, it's. I think that was the the implication. Seems to be whenever I've seen the word barbarian written in a, in a context, when I'm reading like Thucydides or Xenophon or something like that, yeah. it doesn't feel disrespectful. Yeah, well, I think it came from the. Uh, uh, they thought that people that didn't speak Greek kind of sounded just like they were saying bar bar bar. bar, bar. bar, bar, bar yeah. uh, I, I don't know. I've heard people say that, but I don't know if that is really true or not. I, I don't remember. I've, I don't think I've read any primary source that says that. But I've no. heard modern historians say that loads of times. So yeah, I've heard, I've heard that around. I don't know whether it's true or not. But I mean, it's as good an explanation as any. So this great uh, conflict, the Battle of Canaxa, that's uh, which, is that how you pronounce it, Canaxa? I've only uh, ever seen it written down. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this big battle that happens more or less outside Babylon um, is is going to be a big showdown, and it's well, you know, history depends on these days, doesn't it? Um, which oh, way yeah. it goes, this everything. Is a turning point in history. Yeah, I mean, if I could do a quick quote, maybe, from... Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, go ahead. ...text itself. So, Xenophon writes, quote, It was now midday, and the enemy had not yet come into sight. But in the early afternoon, dust appeared, like a white cloud. And after some time, a sort of blackness extending a long way over the plain. Then suddenly, there were flashes of bronze, and the spear points, and the enemy formations became visible. There were cavalry with white armour on the enemy's left, and Tissaphernes was said to be in command of them. Next to them were soldiers with wicker shields, and then came hoplites with wooden shields reaching to the feet. These were said to be the Egyptians. Then there were more cavalry and archers. These all marched in tribes, each tribe in a dense oblong formation. In front of them, and at considerable distances apart from each other, where they were called the scythe chariots. These had thin scythes extending at an angle from the axles, and also under the driver's seat, turned downwards to the ground so as to cut through anything in their way. The idea was to drive them into the Greek rank and cut through them. And that gives sort of quite a good impression, I think. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, you, that sounds terrifying, doesn't it? I, yeah. I, love, I love the way he... Sorry to... Like, I love the way he, um, he introduces the army like appearing, materialising on the plane. Like it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a fine cloud of dust or something, and then it starts getting darker, and then you see sort of the formations and the glint of the bronze just sort of like materializes out of the distance. That's really it's fascinating. Ominous. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it and, would have undoubtedly filled from like horizon to horizon, you know? Yeah, and I don't know if you've ever been at like, a, I don't know, a big football match or something where there's like a huge body of people um, mm -hmm. sort of swaying as one and uh, chanting as one, like that deep sort of guttural... Yeah. You know, thousands of blokes <laughs> chanting something with like well, he, visceral violence in their did, in their gut. Um, does he say that's that a they're terrifying chanting? thing when there's only two thousand dudes doing that? Imagine if it was hundreds of thousands. Well, did, does he say that they were chanting? Because I'm pretty sure he didn't, did he? Oh, uh, sorry. Actually, <laughs> no, quiet, you're quite right. It's the Greeks yeah. that always sing the peon. But the very next yeah. bit, it says, uh, 
Uh, it's quote, but Cyrus was wrong in what he said at the time when he called yeah. together the Greeks and told them to stand their ground against the shouting of the natives. So, so far from shouting, they came on as silently as they could, calmly in a slow, steady march. Yeah, so that, that indicates an actually quite a disciplined force. I yeah. mean, they're marching in, in rectangles, you know, in blocks, mm. and they're, they're actually quiet and well-disciplined. That, that's, that's a professional army. Yeah, and in some respects, it, it might, that might be equally, well, not equally, but in a different way, intimidating and unnerving. Totally. Um, uh, Alexander in, himself used it against the Thracians, the discipline of his army to intimidate the Thracians. There's one other little bit just at the beginning of this battle where I think it is the very first time that Xenophon mentions himself as sort of as, as a character in his own. Ah, right. Is this, is this the first time? Well, I think it's when uh, he says uh, Cyrus rides up and down the line and and, mm. and, uh, and Xenophon comes forward and asks him if he has any any further orders or anything. And you sort of get this first hand glimpse of both Xenophon and Cyrus. And Cyrus just sort of says, um, uh, the, 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 all the uh, sacrifices look good. It's going to be a good day. And that's, that's sort of all you get. Uh, <laughs> but it's like this little, this, yeah, this just little insight. And you see them both personally. You know, it's sort of, yeah. if it was a film, it sort of zooms in on them for a yeah, moment, yeah, for like two yeah. lines. Um, it's just it's great. That is awesome. And that, that again, it sounds cinematic, doesn't it? Like, you, like just describing what you're describing sounds like a movie. Yeah. Um, that was another thing, though, I wanted to say in general that, these books are like Thucydides or, or Xenophon or whatever are a little difficult to read for some people, for a lot of people, I think most people, because if you pick up like a Dan Brown or a Tom Clancy or something, it really is like reading a, a TV show or a movie. They, they spell everything out for you. They, it's, like they're, it's like they're describing what you would see on a screen, isn't mm -hmm. it? And, and they, they describe everything for you, whereas uh, older writers, even, even Victorian writers, but certainly like ancient writers, they don't do any of that for you or when they do it's it's really sparingly done it's just here and there um, that is a, a great uh, observation you, you can tell that there's the assumption of familiarity with the uh state of the world that they go with and so like the like you say with the flashing bronze on the on the men coming through when you get when you get a tiny detail like that it suddenly gives you a lot more oomph to it you know it's it's very noticeable because they so rarely do it and yeah, it's, you really it, it's very frustrating because, it. like, the there it's a totally different world. Like, w like, thank God Al they told us that Alcibiades knocked the bloody the dicks off of these fucking things, the these Hermes, because I wouldn't have known that they had them on. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know there was a statue of a god there. You know, it, like, it it fleshes out the world. These silly details that very rarely get included. Yeah, and and the, just the way the stories are constructed, and the way they do narrative. It's just different to a modern writer. So, for example, there's a character which barely appears in Xenophon called Areus. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But it, it's clear that they sort of wanted him to be their king. And, um, but it doesn't really, it's not really mentioned very often. And it's said, so it is stated explicitly that, like once, <laughs> you know. <And> you're <laughs> I supposed don't even to, remember that. Yeah, exactly. And you're supposed to just sort of completely take that on board and remember that. And and as, as a modern reader, you don't, you're not really used to that. If there was a character like that in a, say, a, a Tom Clancy novel, they would mm. hammer that home to you again and again and again, how important he is, you know? It's very event-oriented uh, through, like, narrative points. And then, you, mm. like, this seems to be like a separate narrative that Xenophon isn't telling that has suddenly intruded on the main one. Oh, by the way, this guy wants to be a king. But anyway, like I was saying about this person over here, you know, like, that's how it looks. Yeah, well, there's another thing, another strand that runs through this that sort of um, historians have picked up on, that, that um, Xenophon sort of tries to make himself out to, or does make himself out to be basically the leader or if not the yes. not the outright leader but one of the main ones but it, that yeah. couldn't necessarily really have been the case maybe we'll get into that a bit later but um yeah, yeah I'm so very suspicious so it, about xenophon's self-positioning yeah. in this story yeah yeah no that's one of the main things to say about it in the grandest sense is that how much is he really like what's his angle what does he want out mm -hmm. of this? What is he? You know, there's there's a lot more to it. There's it's like this story is a bit of an onion. You can keep peeling, and there's many many there's many yeah. more layers than you think there's going to be. It seems like a straightforward narrative, but it's not. It's interesting how they do tell the narratives in sort of action oriented way, though, rather than like a sort of a no more literary way that we would be used to these days. Mm. It's an interesting observation. So, so this Int big sorry one one thing is oh, sorry. before yeah intent is often very much assumed. 
um, throughout the Greek narratives. Like they assume that like Tisiphernes did this because he hates the Greeks, you know, or you know, whatever, you know. But in, intent is always ascribed. Yeah, yeah. I find I, that I, very interesting. Yeah, I've heard. I, I read an essay on on this uh, recently uh, for for this, um, and the guy was saying that that the Nabasis is something of a uh, a, a detective work of history that uh, you you really have to sort of really probe into Xenophon's life before and after what what yeah. bits we know from sort of Pausanias and uh, uh, Diogenes and Diodorus you know, bits and bobs later writers and because so one of the important things is that Xenophon was exiled from Athens um, after this at some point after this whole expedition mm-hmm. and, and and many people say that this that the Anabasis was written as something of an apology or to sort of excuse himself or at least explain exactly what went down and um and and that the probable primary audience was other athenians um yeah yeah and there's loads of things in the text that sort of do if you read it in that light do really point to that um but if you didn't know any of that that would probably pass you by give me an example off the top of your head because i can't think of one oh well one of the main ones is is the very end where he sort of leaves well well, the whole theme of homecoming <laughs> runs through it. You know, it's called uh, the Anabasis, Anabasis means, what would you say, going up country? The going up, yeah. But the, the going it, up, it always felt up. like a sort of, it felt like a pan-Greek thing to me. The thing is that that going up country is ends mm. after book two, and the whole rest of the story is actually the homecoming, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's a return. It's like a, a, yeah. an, an odyssey, like Odysseus yeah. coming home. And when, when they finally when they finally reach the sea and they break into the ripple of cries going back through the line, yeah. honestly, that's a genuinely emotionally moving moment. But it, yeah, it didn't yeah. feel like it was purely for Athens, you know, because it was such a diverse force from across Greece. Like I've, it, it, the the way it came across to me. Sounded like a, I mean, they're called the Hellenes, you know, that's how they refer to themselves. So it felt very sort of um, as the ethnic group rather than the city group. Yeah. Maybe and, that's just uh, me, you know. No, no, I think you're right. Because one of the, another essay I was reading is saying that, um, apparently, because I don't read it in the original Greek, <laughs> but apparently in the original, it's deliberate that he says, we all, we're going home. It's a homecoming. He doesn't talk about Hellas. He doesn't talk about Greek, uh, Greece hmm. very much. He nearly always says, a homecoming it's always that we're homeward hmm. bound um yeah. we're trying to get home and he doesn't necessarily say so it's a uh, yet yeah, much more of a, a generic thing than just than just greece or, or he- see I, I i took it in the context of them being referred to as the hellenes um as uh, you know so when you say homecoming well hellas is the home of the hellenes so right sure, and sure. so and so when they see the sea they're like oh we're here you know and then, then the when the, oh, we, I'm skipping ahead, loads of stuff here. But um, when 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 they end up getting uh, to the Black Sea and they see a Greek city and they're thinking of sacking it, and he's like, "Well, we've sacked, you know, we haven't sacked any barbarian cities up till now." And then we found a Hellenic city and we're thinking about it. It's like it does say a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, why? But, well, that their ultimate goal, lest we forget, is that they're mercenaries. So their ultimate goal yeah. is, is is money and oxen and uh, and and pretty boys. But they didn't do it to any of the barbarians on the way, you know. Well, like not. Yeah, not well, they had precious either. little chance. I mean, they were running through yeah. the mountain, the Armenian mountains. But um, yeah, that's true. Well, well, they, back, they, back there to was the battle of Canaxa there. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, uh, no, sorry. Did you, if you want, sorry, if you wanted to say something else, I didn't want to just... No, 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 no. I, I'm just getting off on tangents because it's just interesting stuff that I think further supports my theories. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it is one of those yeah. stories that you keep... Uh, there's some books where you can't read more than a page or two before you realise your eyes are scanning it and you're not really reading it because your mind's going off on some other tangent because of the interesting thing you just read, you know? I don't yeah. know if you have that happen a lot, but... All, all the time, yeah, all the time. <laughs> It's insufferable. That's honestly that's why I listen to audiobooks quite a lot because then I don't have control over that, um, so I'm kind of kept on track. Um, but the the Battle of Canaxa I thought was a really interesting thing, um, and Cyrus seems absolutely heroic in it. Um, oh, yeah. But he dies in the first charge. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah. If I could read another quick paragraph, uh, exactly Please. that. that. Um, yeah. Quote. Then Cyrus, fearing that the king might get behind the Greeks and cut them up, because the Greeks had won their wing of the battle and gone off the field almost. The um, enemy had not even stood to withstand them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, their wing had just run away in fright yeah. from them, essentially, yeah. Um, so um, Cyrus, fearing that the king might get behind the Greeks and cut them up, 
moved directly towards him. With his 600, he charged into and broke through the screen of troops in front of the king, routing the 6,000, and is said to have killed their commander, Artaxerxes, with his own hand. But while they turned to flight, Cyrus's own 600 lost their cohesion in the eagerness for the pursuit, and there were only a very few left with him, mostly those who were called his table companions. When left with these few, he caught sight of the king and the closely formed ranks around him. Without a moment's hesitation, he cried out, I see the man, and charged down on him and struck him a blow on the breast, which wounded him through the breastplate, as Stesias, the doctor says, saying also that he dressed the wound himself. But while he was in the very act of striking the blow, someone hit him hard under the eye with a javelin. In the fighting there between Cyrus and the king and their supporters, Cestias, who was with the king, tells how many fell on the king's side, but Cyrus was killed himself, and eight of the noblest of his company lay dead upon his body. End quote. These people live in a Homeric myth, I swear to God. Yeah, I mean, the idea of charging, <laughs> charging on horse with a few dozen guys against a few hundred guys or a few thousand guys it's just it's insane i mean it's uh, it, to me it's, it's incredible almost beyond belief i think that we do have to believe that they were bold enough to do stupid things like this though oh no i think it's true i have faith that it, it, it yeah. happened um just i'm saying if it was me if i quantum leaped into their body I yeah would, i'd run away i, 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 I wouldn't be there myself or faint or something yeah yeah I'd be too worried about saving my own skin, but I, I believe that there were people in the past who literally didn't. Um, or, and the thing is, I think um, another thing as well is when you play, you know, you plated up an armor and stuff like this, like you, you probably are more bold. You know, you probably feel more bold. You think, well, hang on, I'm covered in armor that can resist swords and stuff. So I don't care if they've got swords. Let's have this, you know, especially if you're a trained warrior, like he probably was. So, you know, we, we might be yeah. completely underestimating how we'd feel in that situation if we'd been trained to fight and we had armor on. Um, but yeah, the, I, but I love how it's suitably heroic. You know, I see the man and then he charges <laughs> him. I mean, that's a great, you know, great one line of it. You know, you can feel the you can feel the passion in it. You know, that he's yeah. just he's not even he's not thinking about something like flowery or, you know, trying to make it sound any more than it, you know, an impassioned, right. You know, I see the man is very basic and, you know, then he wounds him through his armor. You know, that's, that's properly heroic for getting stabbed down by his guards or whatever. Yeah. And of course it's his brother. Remember? Yes, it's exactly, you know, so he's, cause he's pissed off at his, bro his brother. Yeah. So, his own brother. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's one or the other has to die basically, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's very, it's got multiple like layers of investment for Cyrus, which is interesting. Um, yeah, and it's a shame, and it means that basically the whole expedition, the whole point of the book up to this point, because Xenophon yeah. doesn't give any, any indication that the book is going to be about this massive, long escape and evasion exercise, um, you just think, if you're reading it for the first time, that it, you, we're going to topple the king and, and yeah. enter Babylon, and then suddenly it's like, oh no, that's not happening. Uh, <laughs> Wait, we, we what just does lost... this mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, yeah. you could just... Th th this... So I, I, I find this absolutely fascinating because the Greeks, when they're approaching the Egyptians and the, or whoever it is on, you know, opposing them, um, they, uh, I'm sure they get like cavalry come at them and they javelin the cavalry or the chariots. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the chariots run through them. It even says at yeah. one point it runs over one guy, but he's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they laugh at the chariots. They're mocking yeah. the chariots and chucking yeah. javelins at them. So the, the Greeks are in high spirits through this battle. Like, they're having fun, you know? <laughs> That's what I found really interesting about this. There's a real sense of camaraderie there and, like, strength in, no, strength in togetherness, you know? And then yeah. when, they, when they, they, they level their spears and charge the, 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 the Asiatics, as they describe them, um, it's interesting how he says they don't even stand to, stay to withstand the charge. So the Greeks just seem like they're pumped up and having a great day and then just wipe through the enemy who just disappear off into the distance forever to have fled. And then they just at the end of it, just stood around because they don't actually know what to do next. Do they? Yeah, that's exactly what well, they think. They've what their side has won the day. They don't know uh, that Cyrus has been killed. Yeah. And uh, uh, from their perspective, they've, they've won their side of, of yeah. Of everything battle. went great. Good and, day. Uh, yeah, and, and well, a messenger comes to him saying, well, you're going to surrender now, give up your arms, right? And they're like, what are you talking about? 
what were you no, yeah. you give up your arms <laughs> yeah yeah we won what are you talking about you know but you can you can just imagine messages saying well, what do you mean uh, cyrus is dead we've got his body I'm like what it's like well cyrus is dead it's like, what does that mean that means all the asiatics have defected to artaxerxes what does that mean? That means you you are left here on this piece of battlefield that you won and no one's on your side and you're a thousand miles from home and you don't have any reason to be here. So <laughs> like what, yeah. a, what a shit uh, situation. Yeah, fucked pretty badly. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, well, it well, it's So terrible, we're here to accept terrible. your surrender. That's the that's what that's what the bargaining position is from Artaxerxes messenger. Like yeah, well, they say to him, "Look, give up your arms. You're basically <laughs> you're basically um, under arrest, sort of thing." And and the Greeks uh, um, like have a think about it and say, <laughs> "Well, no. The only thing we've got left is our our swords and our courage. Yep. Um, and if if we give up our swords, you know, our courage won't be much use to us. So yeah, <laughs> so, so so no, uh, we're not doing that." And uh, we might as well just charge you. We might as well just attack you now. Why don't we just we we just you, we just pushed you off the field. We're the winners. <laughs> um, and but and interestingly, the 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 sort of Persian response to that is to be like, okay, well maybe then we can negotiate something. If you won't just give up your arms, maybe we can negotiate something. Which of course reveals to the savvy Greeks that yeah. in fact the Persians aren't in a massively strong position because if they were, they would just march just on kill them right now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's really really interesting, isn't it? How the Persians sound like pussy cats. Like the the I I love the fact that the Greeks didn't even get to properly engage. You know, the the Persians k- failed to kill the single Greek that they hit with the chariots, and they didn't even stand stay to actually fight it out. So no wonder the Greeks are feeling like they're made of steel. But it's a terrifying position that they are in, though. And uh, sorry, I'll let you carry on yeah. with it because it gets worse. It does get worse. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, well, so yeah, they're in this difficult situation. What, what, what to do uh, exactly? And uh, you know, it's not clear what the best thing is to do. And that some of their own Greeks that had come along with them decide to uh, go over to the Persian side, and and yeah, there's dissent within. Well, it gets to the point where who is the overall commander, and is there one overall mind? in charge of, of policy for the whole army. And it doesn't seem that there is, that they just have to um, agree things between the, the top generals, the top strategy, of which Xenophon isn't one yet. Um, it's Proxenos, who is uh, the Boeotian Proxenos, who's sort of the overall command of, of the faction that, that Xenophon is in. So, um, so yeah, well, that I becomes mean, important. The, I'm, I'm, I'm just reading through the notes on Wikipedia. Thankfully, they've got little chapter summaries. And uh, the generals of Cyrus's army obviously can't expect lenient treatment, so they joined the Greeks. Um, but the the Hellenes are frightened by something in the night, which turns out to be nothing. Um, and then the king asks for a truce. And it's interesting how the Hellenes are still in a state of war with the Persians, because I mean, realistically, any like any any other time, you probably like okay, well, you've lost, you know, like the you know there are ten thousand of you, but they're going to be like hundreds of thousands of Persians. The person you've come here to fight for is dead, so you don't even have a cause, because you're not going to put anyone on any thrones. You're not even, you know, you don't have a person to put on the throne. So mm. you may as well just go home. Like, you may as well just go over to the Persians. Like, mm. <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you even. But the, it's some weird Greek pride or something. I don't know. Like, well, we won this bit. It's like, okay, but what are you here <laughs> for? Like, that's your yeah. new boss, you know? It's like, no, I'm at war with my new boss. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, he's paying you. <laughs> He owns the entire empire now, but they don't look at it that way. Yeah, no, I mean they're very proud. I don't know if that's really the really the right word, but but they're proud enough to say, look, no, we or they even bring up that thing that we didn't even know we were going to be marching on Babylon until we were halfway <laughs> here. We were brought here under uh, false yeah. pretenses. So anyway, they decide that they're going to try and march out. <laughs> but they, they, uh, the, the, it's so weird that they, they, they negotiate with. Artaxerxes as if they're peers you know yeah. as, as if they're like in, an independent city state and, and they do suggest at some point forming a city state in somewhere in Persia you know um, yeah yeah or later up on the Black Sea or one historian I've heard describing yeah. the, the 10,000 as a moving polis it, well that's that's basically how it sounds like it sounds like a mobile polis and it, they operate like that you know, they yeah. they view themselves like that as a team, and the the enemy treat them like that. You yeah. know, I, the the, yeah. the the Persians don't try and bribe some of them out, as far as I'm aware. 
you know, yeah. like they all stick together as a kind of homogenous group and the Persians shadow them and chuck stones at them. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when they start moving, they're, they're basically shadowed by the king's army led by Tissaphernes, more or less. Um, yeah. There's, there, there's one bit in um, one of the one of the Dan Carlin ones on the um, King of Kings. He mm. mentions that in Xenophon, there's a bit where they they come across the, the median wall, you know, the, the, and, and I, I didn't I hadn't remembered it. But when I reread the Anabasis, I did come across that bit. It's only sort of three or four lines. I can't remember uh, but, either. What, what's the deal so, with it? So, you know, there's um, the, 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 the Tigris and the Euphrates, are like mm -hmm. the two great rivers that run through yeah. Mesopotamia, which means between the rivers, doesn't it? Um, yeah. and, and there's a bit where they come really close to each other, about 50 or 60 miles apart, the, clo the closest bit. And mm. if you build a wall across there, across that span, um, then, you, you know, you've sort of protected everything south of yeah. it you've got well, an island, basically yeah yeah and um and, and this is what xenophon writes quote after a three days march they came to the wall of media as it is called and passed over to the other side of it this wall was made of burnt bricks laid in bitumen it was 20 feet thick and 100 feet high and was said to be 60 miles long it is quite close to babylon and and uh, again it's just that just says that nothing else doesn't doesn't refer to it again or anything that's fascinating um, isn't it yeah, and, and historians, well, everyone, anyone who reads it, really, but historians just love that sort of thing. It's gold yeah. dust, you know, it really is. But there's no reason to think that there wasn't that one there. I mean, you know, why would he make that up? Oh, no, I mean, it's pretty, yeah, um, uh, yeah there's no reason to well, doubt they, that. At all. It, it, well, this, this is the thing, like, I'm, they, they're always, there's always someone who says, oh, well, there's no archaeological evidence for it, so we're not going to take it. And it's like, come on, you know, that's just, you know, but anyway, sorry, I'm being pedantic. Yeah, he just said it was made out of burnt bricks and bitumen. So yeah, it's not going to have survived <laughs> to nowadays. To yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, <laughs> totally plausible as well. Okay, so the next thing that happened. Well, actually, you say that, okay. but most of the buildings are built out of that, weren't they? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. And we still have the ziggurat of Ur. So I mean, maybe it should have survived. <laughs> It was obviously dismantled at some point. Yeah, well, that, that, that's just a a, a a a massive choke point, is it? It's a really, really yeah, important yeah, yeah. bit of land. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's been worked and reworked over the centuries, over the millennia. That that same little bit of land, you know, there's like one yeah, or there's like a couple of passes going up into yeah. into Austria and Hungary. If you're coming from that way, that yeah, all the armies yeah. would yeah, have to pass through these same couple yeah. of passes. Yeah, so the, the, the Greek army is trying to <laughs> make its way out, out, uh, but they don't. They realise they can't really go back the way they came because there's too many giant rivers, um, <laughs> apart from anything else. Um, what they've got to do is, is try and go more, a more northerly route up towards Armenia and up towards the Black Sea, try and get don't out that way. they actually cross the Tigris at some point? They do have to, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's a bit later, or a lot later. <laughs> they're being, they're being, as you said, shadowed. Well, mirrored um, before we before art. we go on to that, should we yeah. should we talk about Artaxerxes' treachery? Sure. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, that was the bit I was gonna. Yeah, just me. Yeah, because yeah. I think we skipped that. My fault, obviously. Um, yeah. No. No. I, no, I mean that. It, yeah. Where? Um, well, go ahead if you want to. Yeah. yeah this it's it, it's again to the best of my recollection. Um, but Artaxerxes invites the sort of ten generals to a, a dinner. And then basically has them all killed. And the Greeks learn about this because one fellow is running back into camp holding his intestines in. Oh. And it's just like, holy shit. Like, that's a graphic <laughs> description and a half. And, like, and then he's like, you know, oh, and, it, and everyone starts panicking. Everyone's to arms. But that no Persian attack comes. And so everyone's just like, you know, and like, what the fuck are we going to do? And this is where Xenophon really properly introduces himself into the narrative. Where he's, yeah. he's, he's so, I, I open my eyes and I wake up and I'm like, why am I just laying here? You know, I should be right. doing something. I can't remember the exact speech, but like, uh, yeah, the exact, the exact Dude, part. I, I got that. That you've said it almost perfectly. It was the exact. If I just quickly read it, saying sort of eight yeah. or nine lines. Uh, quote: When they arrived at the entrance of Tissaphernes' tent, the generals were invited inside. They were Proxenus the Boeotian, uh, men on the Thessalian, Aegis the Arcanian, Clearus the Spartan, and Socrates the Achaean. The captains waited at the entrance. Not long afterwards, and at one and at one and the same signal. Those who were inside were seized, and those who were outside were massacred. After that, contingents of native cavalry rode over the plain and killed all the Greeks they could find, slaves and free men alike. The Greeks saw with surprise these cavalry manoeuvres from their camp and were in doubt about what they were doing until Nicarchus, the Arcadian, escaped and came there with a wound in his stomach and holding his intestines in his hands. He told them everything which had happened. 
Um, so yeah, you remembered it perfectly. <laughs> well, that, that's that's because it was so goddamn dramatic. Never trust a Persian. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I first read this. There's a couple of things, uh, a couple of times in my life when you're reading something, you're actually shocked as you're reading. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. There was one in 1984 when um, when Winston Smith is first captured. He's, he's he's with that that girl in that room, you know, having that illicit liaison, and he says something like, "We are the dead." And, and just out of the speaker screen or something, Big Brother says, you are the dead, or something like that. You know that bit from it? Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. I remember reading that and being like, actually a bit shocked, like feeling my heart race a bit reading it. Yeah. And I had, when I first read that bit, when it says they're all massacred, I remember having that feeling for the first time. Because yeah. I didn't see it coming. Xenophon gives no indication that that's what's going to happen. And the, the tone of the, even then, it's, it's not written in necessarily an emotional way, but the, the tone of what's happening, because he's, he's really trying to just chronicle events. And like you say, you know, guy runs in with, the, and just describing it, you know, it puts you very much centered in the action of what's happening. And it, it's, it's, um, the, the thing, I wish we'd brought this up at the beginning, but it's a good place to bring it up now. It's contrast it, right? Contrast that when they're back in Asia Minor and Cyrus has just, um, like um got all of the greeks together he's called them all together he summoned them all and so they realize that you know they like a thousand are coming from here three thousand from there blah blah, blah. and I, it's sardis i think it's at um and the all the greeks are there and there, there's a real it's a really upbeat atmosphere that xenophon's describing and then when the queen of wherever some of you know some some tribe near um comes over to and cyrus he wants to show the, her the greeks you know and then so the, they line the Greeks mm -hmm. up, they present spears, whatever it is, and then they, they charge. And the charge scares the shit out of yeah, everyone. Yeah. Merchants run away from their stalls, leaving all their goods behind. You know, the, the queen flees and you know, every, everyone freaks out. And the Greeks just on the, on, off, on the field off this charge, laughing at the barbarians <laughs> for being such cowards. And there's this real sense of fun and camaraderie. This is, a, this, this is why it sounds, the whole thing sounds like a boy's adventure. And this is why it's like an epic narrative. Because now you come to the point where one of the lieutenants or whatever is coming back with his guts hanging out after being betrayed by the Persians a thousand miles from home suddenly it's a lot gloomier and a lot more like conf <laughs> confined you know that they're, they're trapped in a camp in the middle of persia suddenly from this effervescent we can do everything to shit things are at their lowest ebb right now you know it's it's very dramatic yeah yeah and xenophon does that it's been noted that he has like these uh, peaks and troughs or these cycles of sort of levity and it all looks like it's going to yeah. be okay and everything's positive and optimistic and bright and then just doom and gloom and darkness and despair and despondency and it gives uh, you a real, a real feel for the human experience that he had gone through you know rather yeah. than some scientific yeah. historical text he's taking you through what it was the experience of the thing i love it I yeah absolutely love it. Yeah, and and there are, and so this at this point there are uh, the the Greeks the uh, the Cyrenian army Cyrus's army what's left of it is uh, a very low ebb. Um, uh, uh, I mean Xenophon sums it up uh, by saying, "quote With their generals arrested and the captains and soldiers who had gone with them put to death, the Greeks were in an extremely awkward position." <laughs> <laughs> That's great framing. <laughs> it occurred to them. Uh, that they were near the king's capital and that around them on all sides were numbers of peoples and cities who were their enemies. No one's likely in the future to provide them with a chance of buying food. They were at least a thousand miles away from Greece and they had no guide to show them the way. They were shut in by impassable rivers which traversed their homeward journey. Even the natives who had marched on the capital with Cyrus ha had turned against them and they were left by themselves without a single cavalryman in their entire army. Isn't End that quote. amazing? Like that's yeah. just a summary of the situation, but you can feel the walls closing on on you. You know, suddenly yeah. the world that was, it was so big when they're walking through Persia, nothing's stopping them. You know, everything's going great. They can go anywhere. They can do anything. They can, you know, and now suddenly, instead of having this tremendous freedom, like, you, you know, they've got enemies on every side there, cities everywhere. The, the king's men are all against them. It's like, Christ, suddenly you're in a bunker mentality mode. Yeah, and, and with no cavalry, I mean, that's a big thing just on its own, that you've got no Huge, horses, yeah. you've got no cavalry. So even if you were to repel anyone, um, you can't chase them down and, yes. and, and actually kill them, or yeah, many of them the, anyway. The, the enemy can always escape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and, as and you the said, Persian forces are lighter anyway, you know, so they can, they, they can run quite smoothly away from the Greeks anyway. 
yeah, hoplites are relatively heavy. Yeah, heavy, yeah. heavily armored. Well, they are heavy infantry. Yeah. They're yeah. the heaviest yeah. infantry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You don't um, get heavier. And it was, as you said as well a minute ago, that this is the point where Xenophon really comes into it, sort of explodes into it a bit. I mean, the next mm. sentence is, there was an Athenian in the army called Xenophon who accompanied the expedition. Uh, and he goes on to sort of introduce himself a bit. Um, but also at this point, I'd like to point out, which I hinted at earlier, is that Xenophon's like the writer and the author and also a, 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 a character in it, a mm. fictional, uh, not fictional, but a, a, a literary character. Of course, he was also a, a historical figure who, yeah. you know, so he's actually he's playing around with expectations and playing around with the nature of his own role and his own character as he decides to depict it. Um, so what, there's a lot more fun. Yeah, yeah, there is. You're, you're absolutely right. And what I find really interesting, and this is why I found this narrative in particular so compelling, is because the the general question with history is not really what did people do because that's actually quite easy to figure out from the remains that have been left right so you know people went here they cooked here they did this but that's not telling you the the way that the why as to why they did these things you yeah. know it's just showing you what they did and it, an account like xenophon's always tells you why you know he he gives you their reasoning and it's like when when you know the the Greeks were out there, and to to make sure that Cy, um, Artaxerxes doesn't outflank the Greeks, Cyrus charges. You know he tells you the why, even if it's not necessarily true. But that would have been the the feeling, <laughs> the common feeling around. You know, so if you actually want to know how does it feel like to be there, this is I, this is why I think I can actually describe the kind of feeling that comes across from the writing. Is because well, that seems to be what he's trying to get across, whether he knows it or not. You know, I'm not saying this is conscious either. But like it feels like a very like like uh, gonzo journalism, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it's like what yeah. this feels like real time, you know. If you want to know what's if you want to have the experience with me, this is what you. It might not all be accurate, you know. <laughs> like it probably a lot of it might not be, but that was what everyone <laughs> thought, you know. That was the perception of reality. Yeah, and it's it's a well using modern language here, but it was it was a new type of reportage. It's not it hadn't been done before. This, you know. Yes, totally. <laughs> but, putting yourself in as a character in your own history uh, and with your own probably political aims uh, sort of sewn into it as well. And it's more well, like a heroic mythos, you know, it, people have said um, that on one end of the spectrum, it's just a great piece of serious history. And at the other end of the spectrum, it's almost, almost entirely fictional. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it was the narratives, all narratives leave something out. That's why that thing about the the guy with the King, he like just pops in because that there is another narrative that could be told about that guy. I'm sure it's just Xenophon isn't telling it. So like, we don't know. Oh, well, there's loads of things that, um, <coughs> that the historians have said, well, mm. Z Xenophon simply omitting loads of things here. He must be um, yeah. like, for example, for example, the fact that he sort of gives the impression or very, very nearly explicitly says, but doesn't quite explicitly say he's the leader. Yeah, um, yeah and, he does. <laughs> and, and, he, and he says, because he's quite young amongst the Stratos. Yeah. Um, he's quite young. After these, these generals all get murdered, they replace them with new generals, basically the guys that were second in command. They're captains usually. And anyway, Xenophon gets command of Proxenos's faction, you know, a few thousand guys. So he's the rear he's, guard. He gets yeah, the yeah. rear guard. He's not leading it. He's, he's at the back. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's the leader of the rear guard. Good job, Xenophon. Yeah, I mean, and he, good, he but... tries to say that that's like the most prestigious thing because we are on a retreat, because this is a retreating action. To be in the rear guard is actually the most prestigious, most important place to be. But everyone knows that it was the, you know, it would be the Spartan up front that was in control. Yeah, Almost absolutely. Certain. But I mean, the, you know, there, there's an argument that he's making because they're the ones who are actually engaging in combat. So... Yeah, and yeah, it's being chased. So. The Spartan called Clearchus, and he doesn't. Uh, oh no, uh, Chris, Christopher, sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, he, yeah, he just doesn't really talk about him all that much. He, um, and and whenever there's a really big, important sort of tactical, strategic uh, decision that has to be made, Xenophon always presents it that the, the strategoi get together and decide amongst them, amongst themselves as equals. Yeah. When, well, that probably wouldn't have been the case. Um, well, but we know we, don't we know, know from we know from the Peloponnese. It, it probably depends on the on the personality makeup of the group. Because I mean, like in the Peloponnesian War, when you got the the ten 
who are in command of the, the the army and the navy at Samos. Alcibiades basically goes there and takes it over because he's Alcibiades. He's got this fucking giant personality and mm. self confidence. And if there's not someone like that, I imagine it's a bit more democratic. I mean, there were a democracy. Well, like mm. Athens was, you know. Right. I, I I can't imagine it was you know. But I mean, you would th- if it was, you would have an uneven number. So yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah so let's carry on. And so there's there's that great bit you said where he has a, he falls asleep, but he has a dream. And and um, uh, anyone really that reads this uh, usually picks out that bit as a, just a great yeah. bit, a great little episode because it, it is so good. It's like a turning point where you're, yeah. he he sort of takes he sort of takes control. Um, so Xenophon writes of himself, quote, Xen- oh oh oh. The rest of the army, it was night time and they were trying to sleep, but they're like in the lowest depths of despair. And Everyone's um, just been killed or captured. And then they're like, yeah. what are you going to do? There's no attack coming. So they just go to sleep at night. <laughs> yeah. Like, no just... one knows what to do. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like sort of that, uh, you get that all throughout history, all sorts of times. I mean, maybe the Führer bunker springs to mind, but I mean, yeah. what, what do you do? Have a glass of champagne? Shoot yourself in the head? What do you do? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> what are your options? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he says, quote... Uh, Xenophon was no different from the rest and now in their difficult position uh, he was as miserable as anyone else and could not get to sleep however he got to he got a little sleep in the end and had a dream he dreamed that there was a thunderstorm and that a thunderbolt fell on his father's house and then the whole house was on fire he woke up immediately feeling very frightened and considered that in some respects the dream was a good one because in the midst of his difficulties and dangers he had dreamt of a great light from Zeus but in other respects, he was alarmed by it because the dream seemed to him to have come from Zeus in the character of the king and that the fire had seemed to blaze all around him. And this might mean that he would not be able to leave the king's country and would be shut up on all sides by one difficulty or another. Yeah. And so he, he wakes up and he's just like, why am I laying here? Why am I doing something? Yeah, he says, uh, like, what, what am I waiting for? Basically, I'm just uh, paraphrasing yeah. here. But what am I waiting for? Am I waiting for somebody else to take control? Am I waiting for uh, to be a bit older? <laughs> yeah, and he, he does seem to be rather a spur to action for the Greeks. Um, and then they actually start organising and get, get themselves to, to travel north, don't they? Yeah, so that's basically what happens. That he, um, he... Oh, no, one, one of them tries to get a apolo- uh, pardon from the king, don't they? Well, yeah, no, yeah. Well, that's another bit I picked out. Sorry, so, yeah. what, there's just one dude who says, look, why don't we just try and parlay with, with the Persians? Maybe they might have um, something in their hearts that allows them not to massacre us. It's worth a shot, isn't it? Because we're, we're absolutely doomed otherwise. There's just no way out of this. And Xenophon and, and all the others say, say like, sorry, who are you? <laughs> like, um, like, <laughs> uh, uh, like uh, uh, fuck you. Like, uh, are you even a man? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Like no way. Uh, I love how ballsy yeah. they are. It's just they don't care. It's like no, we're obviously not going to surrender. Yeah, it says um, when this guy says that, it says Xenophon. However, cut him short and spoke as follows: uh, "My dear good man, you are the sort of person who neither understands what he sees nor remembers what he hears." And and goes on to say, "Don't you remember they just massacred all our generals? Uh, uh, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't you remember? Don't you remember they wanted us to surrender and we were going to be." tortured and stuff like you, you piece of shit and they say we should treat him as an animal i think it's actually <laughs> what they said let's just treat him as a pack animal going forward <laughs> <laughs> that's the sort of attitude we should have taken to brexit and remainers <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's that's, just, let's just that's treat Dominic Reeve as a pack animal uh, yeah basically like any any joe swinton God. Right, okay. Um, so, yes. So, yeah, well, I mean, um, they, they have to, they just push on through the country, and it's, yeah. it, I mean, it's hard going. They are sort of harried along the way, the slings and arrows. Um, well, about yeah, Tisiphanes no. brings apparently quite a large contingent of troops. Um, like, you know, hard to estimate how many, obviously. But, I mean, it, it's going to be more than the Greeks had, no doubt. The, the Persians mm-hmm. can easily afford to gather more than 10,000 men. So, and they had them on hand as well. So, you know, it, I mean, it's probably like 50 or 60,000 um, at the very, at the very, I, I, I'd say, I mean, that's the reasonable that's what I've heard. What do you think? How many do you yeah. Um, uh, well, um, well, Xenophon doesn't seem to give precise, precise figures. Um, have but, them, could he? Uh, 
Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, they're certainly outnumbered and harried along the way. And it, as I said before, it goes in sort of um, uh, peaks and troughs of when it seems like they've got a bit of space and a bit mm. of breathing space. And then they're, they're hard on their tail. And it's like this long range uh, fight between their archers and their slingers. And yeah. um, and and the the Greeks have got some sort of handful of archers and, and slingers. And, well, the, pe- this is pe- well, the, this is worth talking about because, like, um, as they're going along, they so the, is this this is after they've crossed the tig- uh, the Tigris, is it? Uh, well, it's around this time, yeah, yeah, it's yeah all, so all it's, along this this period of the march, yeah, yeah, because the I I can't remember how how did the crossing go. Uh, well, they eventually get up to they they come to a point where they can't cross it. They don't think they can cross it, and they're sort of stuck there for a day. And then actually, Xenophon has a, another dream where he's, it's basically a dream where he's like, "I've got to do something." And anyway, they the, some scouts just find up the river. It's just um, a little way uh, upstream. Yeah. Is uh, it's it just happens to be a ford, some sort of ford area where you can wade through it. Yeah, at the waist, right. and and they thank the gods when 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 <clears throat> uh, when Xenophon finds out, he literally does a sacrifice right there on the spot in Thanksgiving, <laughs> and like they're almost crying with thanks that they can um, just go a couple miles up the stream, basically uh, up a tributary, and 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 cross the stream, and and they do, and they get the jump on the on the Persians that are trying to sort of that's right because the Persians them. are on the other side of the river, shadowing yeah, them, aren't they, with a huge army, yeah. Yeah, so it's like a, a double good fortune. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and and there's another good bit around this time. Like, there's a lot of uh, descriptions of um, rear guard actions and and sort of yeah. long range uh, archers and slingers versus versus each other. But there's a great bit where when they're getting towards the foothills of the Armenian mountains, yeah, yeah. this is uh, there, there's a race for a, a certain hilltop or a peak or a crop of high land, um, yeah. that, and they have to race for it and. Um, yeah, and another no, no, it's it's absolutely thing. great that bit because they yeah they're going up into the well bef- uh, before that then there was um where they <clears throat> because the Greeks originally didn't have any slingers um and so they paid like two hundred Rhodians who happened to be in the army uh, to make slings and and then go and engage the Persians um so like the next time the Persians came up with their archers the Greeks sent their slingers out the slings have a, a greater range than the archers and yeah. I actually I know this first hand because i actually made some slings myself and went and tested them out um you can throw a stone a fucking long way with a sling yeah. and i tell you what you do not want to be hit with it either so it yeah. i found it I, yeah so I, uh, like I, I would actually go out there and listen to this audiobook so i just found it really fun because i'm a i'm an absolute nerd that way um but the 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 fun of doing it is interesting because they didn't just swing them repeatedly around their head. I reckon. I reckon that's not how they worked. I think it was all one smooth motion, um, because you can get really good uh, accuracy with it as well, like relative accuracy, obviously. But um, but I found yeah, the. I think you're right. Sometimes you see Palestinian people throwing <laughs> using a, a sort of an ancient sling, and that's oh, how they do it, isn't it? It's one just it's one round fluid yeah. thing and done. Yeah, yeah, that, and that's the, it, the, there was a style online. I don't know how accurate this is. It's called Byzantine style, and that's like they're they you know from I don't know, various depictions and carvings and stuff. But the, the the you know the sort of swing it around once in a long sort of thing. You, you'd need a lot of space for slingers. Mm. They they take up a lot of mm. space, I think. But um, they they would be bloody dangerous to have like hundreds of them chucking stones at you be a very unpleasant experience and i found i found the uh, the way that xenophon characterizes it really interesting because they've been punished for a few days by the the persians their arrows and slings and stuff uh that you know a couple of casualties and that's you know a couple of injuries and you know not deaths but it's been rough and then so that night they they build the slings and then they send the slings out the next day and the the way he phrased it was something like the persians got the worst of it that day and it's like <laughs> you know it was it was just you know an interesting way to to summarize it but you can tell there'd been a bit of a skirmish and the persians had come off like going oh shit that was bad yeah and it's funny in the languages because what you're really talking about is someone getting their head caved in by a rock it's probably yeah it's probably it sounds like horrible a sport. and he's just it saying oh like they had the worst match. of it that day yeah it sounds like a football game you know <laughs> It's like you know that team had the worst of it in that match or something, you know. It, it's it's all and and like you say, when it comes to seizing the high peaks, uh, going up into the Armenian mountains, um, it's very interesting how it sounds like a sports team game, doesn't it? You know, it's the same kind of mentality. It's like we're going to get up there, then we're going to grab it, and it's it's gamification of like the the, the war that they're fighting. Yeah, it's it's, it's really interesting. It's it, it it's a total team sport that they're doing. 
Yeah, no, definitely. I um, yeah, and the the way you get the impression that the captains are like the, they really are the bravest, most impetuous, you know, more, almost yeah. suicidally brave uh, among them because yeah. they sort of they they compete with each other to be yeah. the, the the first to the highest ground, which is contested, or or the first over a wall, or whatever it is. Yeah, and it's 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 genuinely like they're rushing into the jaws of death. You know, <laughs> to the, I mean, they don't they win actually, so they're not. But like they're 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 hyper competitive, um, and mm. you can, and it does it, but it does feel like rousing. You know, when when they're talking about it, you can you can sense the excitement of what they're doing because of the danger that's involved. You know, but most of them came back alive at the end of it, so yeah, you know, it can't. And, have, you know, we we might be overstating the case. And it is a bit like in the Iliad, all the, 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 the all the great heroes in the Iliad are sort of competing with each other for battle honors, and it yeah. it really is like they're just trying to emulate that or relive that. Yeah, um, it's totally the Greek culture is unbelievably warlike. Like people forget, like most cultures are not quite this heroic minded when they're doing things like this. It's, it, it's, it really is a product of the, the sort of mythology of the culture. It's re- I find it amazing. I, this is why I fell in love with like the, the Hellenic world, man. I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> and the, and the like, desire to Let's try and heroes. record it as well. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. I was just talking shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, like they go up into the mountains and, yeah, there's like one of the first parties they go, they have to, as I say, almost a race up there to contend it and they win that. And they're sort of, apparently Xenophon was cheering them on going, you know, remember your country, remember your families. Yeah men and yeah it's rousing you know so it's something that you think if they made a film out of it they would probably the screenwriter would almost certainly include that bit um it's epic isn't it yeah it is, and like i can't believe there isn't a movie of this because it genuinely is heroic and yeah, it's got all of the ups and downs and into the mountains it gets quite um well again this is um, an even darker period now a cycle of really getting really quite dark i f- i when i read it i've read xenophon through two or three times now bits more than that and this seems to be probably the darkest episode where it's hard to remember when I first read it, but where I thought, well, maybe it does end in complete disaster um, because it sort of really does try and give you the impression that it's going that way at this point. Um, it's like it's snow. It's really cold. Oh, well, there's one night where um, loads of guys just sit down and they're just going to die of hypothermia if, if Xenophon, of course, it's Xenophon himself, personally rouses them uh, back into action. And... Um, because as leader of the rear guard, if you're moving up, you're the last guys. If there's guys sitting down in the snow that are going to, you know, well, basically going to die of hypothermia, if yeah. you don't get them and move them, get them to keep them no going, one no one will. Yeah. This is the hunger thing, isn't it? Where they're, they've been traveling and they're just like, have a weird hunger phase where they just lack energy and they have a little bit of food and then suddenly they're back on their feet, right? Yeah, it's funny. They use the word bulimia. It's really weird. Is um, that the word? There was, there yeah, was a different yeah. word when I was... In two different translations, um, I've, 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 they said the men were suffering from bu- bulimia, but it just describes being extremely hungry. Yeah, um, and having uh, zero energy and then having a tiny yeah. amount of food. And then Because Xenophon knew what to do. He'd seen it before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, actually, food is quite an interesting um, theme throughout this because a lot of their travails are about trying to get enough food. That's a really great point. Um, I, love, I love the way that the, the idea of law and order hasn't broken down. Like when they say uh, one, in the translation I read, I found it very interesting. This is why I remember this is they, they, they didn't think any of the villages or towns would furnish them with a market. That's such an interesting turn of <laughs> phrase, isn't it? Mm. Like, because that, that makes it sound like it's the decision of the villages and towns that they're going through, which means that the Greeks aren't just plundering rapey barbarians themselves. You know, they're, they're actually very civilized and they buy, <laughs> you know, they, they exchange money for food along the way. And they, they don't yeah. do any plundering, which is really interesting. Yeah, well, there's one bit much later on where um, um, Xenophon says, uh, puts those words in his own mouth. He says exactly that to someone or other, saying, um, yeah. look, if you will sell us food, we'll buy it. And if you won't, we're going to take it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so it's up to you. Either way, we're eating. Thanks. Yeah. But it's it's very interesting, and I find it interesting how they take the baggage car as well. They they literally march in a square with the baggage in the middle, obviously, um, which is you know as you'd expect, I suppose. But uh, I find it interesting yeah. that we get these details, you know. 
Yeah, well, one of the things probably might be a good point to mention now is that, um, uh, you know, having the baggage in the middle and some sort of square formation is that um, Xenophon personally, again, ascribes to himself um, the, the, <laughs> the, the genius moves of, of creating like a really, really new and innovative um, types of formation in specific. Yeah. In, in specific circumstances and that and that they always work and that the rear guard might sometimes overtake that the vanguard and and that the you know you move the wings in or out for certain situations and and he always makes the right play and um and, yeah uh, the, the the rear guard going advance of the vanguard is pretty unbelievable to me i have to say it does sound like him blowing his own trumpet doesn't it <clears throat> yeah, well, that is a thing. A lot of it is kind of yeah. self-ingrandizing. You can't get away <laughs> yeah. from that. Um, or maybe he was really, really clever. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it was that thing we talked about in the other one about uh, Pericles, isn't it? When you hear deeds that you don't think you could do, you become incredulous of them. But Absolutely. That, but that doesn't mean shit. They could well have happened. Exactly. And the thing is, I was, I was thinking about this a lot, right? And there's, there's always the, uh, there's like a golden rule right when something happens do something right uh, doing nothing means that you definitely fail yeah when there's a crisis you know it doesn't matter what it is it, you might fail whatever it is you do might have been the wrong thing to do but doing nothing is definitely the wrong thing to do mm. so make sure you do something because you don't know what the result of the action is going to be and it might be in your favor and i get the feeling that a lot of this kind of ancient military mindset was kind of based in the same thing it's like if you go in hard and scare the enemy they'll they might fuck up you know you'll definitely get a swing um they they might run away or scream or cry or whatever you know and you you it gives you a more likely chance of winning that's the mindset but the thing mm. is it might actually do that you know it that might actually be the case and that's why they have these heroic narratives because they do work you know and look look with these ten thousand. Something like six, seven thousand of them get back to Greece. That's good odds, you know. More than half of them get back to Greece in the end. So being ballsy, you know, balls to the wall for Lord Flashhearts, well, okay, <laughs> maybe it works. Like, because if the other guys aren't like that, they're going to be like, oh shit, what's going on? Run away, you know, which is exactly what the Persians did. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, this, this like confident, ballsy kind of culture really worked for them. You know, it got them home. Yeah, yeah. Well, it served them well. I mean, it must have been so frustrating from the Persian side to see that the, the, this body of men are just acting really intelligent. Like, you ever play her? You ever play a strategy game like Command and Conquer or something like yeah, that? And yeah, the yeah. AI is just way too good. And yeah. you're like, oh, fuck, <laughs> no, yeah, whatever no. I do, they've they've already thought of that and counted it. <laughs> um, I haven't played yeah. any AI that good, but um, <laughs> uh, which is a shame. But but that's the thing, isn't it? You know, like it's it it's a long march, and they they have to think about it. So, I was just to say, with the, the the angle that Xenophon sort of presents um, himself as sort of the, uh, the grand strategist, yeah, but it's grand being told from his perspective, um, I suppose he's gonna. It, it does, um, yeah. You can't really avoid the question of whether it's even really plausible um, in 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 some cases, but uh, again, well, that might need, be us we, just doubting. I mean, I, yeah, I would have thought that Alcibiades was plausible, but it wasn't him telling the story, so yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. oh, sorry. I was just going to say, there's, there's one pretty sad bit when they're up in the mountains, really in the, the, the snowy mountains. It's also winter by this time. Um, this whole thing yeah. takes place over about a year uh, between 400 and 399 uh, BC. And this point's uh, in the winter. And then they're, they're in the Armenian mountains in winter. It's cold as, cold as hell, you know, really deep snow drifts yeah, and stuff. It's awful. Uh, and and there's one really sad episode where they have to take some pass or other and that they're able to sort of seize the the higher ground and uh, they're able to take this sort of this this mountainous village or town and 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 the people as like something from Okinawa start throwing yeah. the women, babies the, the women and holding yeah. babies start throwing themselves off the cliff and the Greeks can't stop them from doing it, and it's uh, just really horrible. And they they pull try, in in trying to stop them throwing themselves over the cliff. One or two of the Greeks are pulled over, yeah, uh, to their deaths. Um, yeah, and it's really interesting how it describes it, like it's um, um, yeah, like a valley with high points where people are pushing down rocks, and the Greeks to get through to get to the the village, the Greeks have got to again compete with one another to see who can be the first to get through without being killed. Yeah. And it's like. What a, what a competition that is, you know, mm -hmm. but that's, but as soon as they get through the, the villagers put, put up no more resistance and then just start throwing themselves off the high points. 
and it's re- it's mm. really harrowing again yeah. just like when the when the um uh, what, you know the, the captains come back with their guts hanging out it's a really harrowing thing because the greeks did not want them to kill themselves you know they weren't there to butcher them or anything they just needed food and shelter so it's it's again like it shows you how like civilized they they were actually you know because i mean the, i can think of many barbarian hordes that would have been raping and pillaging all through this empty empire you know this would have been like fucking manna from heaven for them but the greeks are incredibly civilized by comparison it, it, it genuinely surprised me that the greeks are like you know harrowed by the fact that they kill their children and the women kill the children and stuff like this and throw them so on yeah, well, it's another thing about, about Xenophon himself that seems to come through is that he actually cares about the individual soldiers. Or oh, it's a criticism yeah. that other people say of him that he cares for the common soldier too much. That, that he doesn't one. really do for a good general. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and that, yeah, and that he sees them as each individual person, uh, each individual soldier yeah. is worth yeah. trying to save. Yeah, um, absolutely. That, and it's very interesting how when all the generals die, he gives you quite a lot of backstory on each general. How one had a particular fondness for boys, and one had, you know, he loved right, war yeah. and stuff like this. You know, it, like it, there's that you get to know the generals. He wants to honor them as individuals, you know. Um, and then you get points where, like, you know, in, on one time they lose two warriors, and I'm thinking, man, if I, like for me, two people out of ten thousand or whatever, probably not something you're going to pick up on. But because Xenophon's like there fighting with them, it matters to him, and so he mentions yeah. it. It's, I find that very, it's 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 very adorable, to be honest. I find it very endearing. Yeah, and I think that was part of well, that that was part of uh, Xenophon's intention to make the the, the 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 character that he paints of himself to be endearing and um, uh, well, because ultimately he wanted to try and be um, unexiled. Well, that's not the right word. He he wanted to be allowed back into Athens, and um, and so th- this whole work, some have argued, and I would probably agree, is is um, at some at least in part an exercise in saying, uh, look, I, I, I didn't particularly do anything wrong. I don't, certainly don't deserve exile. Here's what happened. <laughs> Xenophon and, uh, did nothing wrong, you know... written by Xenophon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why, why I'm a good guy did nothing wrong. So, yeah, I, the, but I mean, he's hardly going to write himself to be bad, is he? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it'd be very hard. And it was written years later, so it'd be very yeah. hard not to, um, you know, just make it a bit r- more rosy tinted yeah. than it than it really was and there were there were thousands and thousands of people involved i mean these this would have been a common series of stories up and down taverns all over greece afterwards like you know there would have been some in almost every city you know mm. but there's another mm. thing people forget that's a that's a large number when you've got what i mean like what the two three hundred greek cities yeah, yeah. you know you've got six thousand soldiers there's probably a couple even small villages probably might have had one guy come back you know yeah, no, sure. It, you know, like so, it, w- it would have been something that would have left a mark. So he couldn't have just made up a story out of whole cloth because it would have been someone who literally was there to say, "Shut up, Xenophon." <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, um, uh, well, there are others uh, like uh, well, Diogenes is uh, contemporary almost, um, and uh, yeah, there's there's no doubt that this march of the ten thousand happened. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, the, just the whether it was Xenophon's speech yeah. that. Uh, sorry, the 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 major sort of plot points i guess we could call them probably accurate yeah um, yeah yeah but it just you know whether it was xenophon who personally yeah. inspired the whole <laughs> army like 20 different times it might, <laughs> that might not be true but and then everyone clapped signs in fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's the original everyone clapped me it really was that um there's one little episode uh, just before they all sort of enter the mountains. I'd like to quickly go back to and just say mm. one quick word on uh, uh, was just that um, um, it's the bit where they come across Nineveh, the, the ruins of Nineveh. Yes, that's and I just think it's a great it? episode. Again, uh, just one that's worth sort of just pointing out to anyone who's listening. You might fancy reading it. That is, it's just so great. It's only one paragraph, but go you know, ahead. it just says go there's ahead. these giant, these giant. Well, I mean, I've got it here. I could read, it, I suppose, but. Um, Oh yeah. Oh, and they even though it's, it was Nineveh, the ruins of Nineveh, they call it uh, Messilia, Messila, Silla. Yeah. Anyway, uh, quote from here, a day's march of eighteen miles brought them to a large undefended fortification near a city called Messila, which was once inhabited by the Medes. The base of this fortification was made of polished stone, in which there were many shells. It was fifty feet broad and fifty feet higher. On top of it was built a brick wall fifty feet in breadth and a hundred feet higher. The perimeter of the fortification was 18 miles. Medea, the king's wife, is supposed to have taken refuge here at the time when the Medes lost their empire to the Persians. 
and the king of the Persians, when he besieged the city, could not take it either by the passing of time or by assault. Zeus, however, drove the inhabitants out of their wits with a thunderstorm, and so the city was taken, end quote. Yeah, that's not accurate. Well, no, no, well... <laughs> No, for anyone, so for anyone who wants to know, that's not how it fell. Yeah, no, it's funny to say, it. again, I was reading it in an essay saying, uh, why is Xenophon, Xenophon probably knew that wasn't right. Uh, yeah. Why has he, he left out, he's left out loads of things there. Um, well, it's, and, well there, the there are a few things. Rock, and yeah, yeah, loads of things. Yeah, well, there, there are, there, like, um, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire until it was taken by the Babylonians and the Persians, or the Medes, sorry, the Persians. Yeah, no, the Persians and the Medes. It was a massive city that was like the center of the world for like a hundred years. Um, and he didn't even know what it was. He thought it was a Persian city. That's how poor the Greek understanding of what had been going on in Persia was. Um, but the, the, the Assyrian understanding of that is all quite quite good, or was, until they, they fell. Um, and the, 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 the local Persian knowledge of it was good. You know, they would have known, but the Greeks didn't, which is interesting. Um, but the size of it is the thing that's really remarkable um, mm. because none, none of the Greek cities, it wasn't something like 16 kilometers on one side or something, the walls or the circuit. Uh, yeah, so it was 18, what was it? I just read it. Yeah, 18 mm. kilometers, 18 miles. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's enormous for an ancient city. Like they must have, and the, the 50 feet wide, 100 feet tall walls. That's like a road. Like, <laughs> that's like a, that's a that's enormous, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's gigantic. Yeah, it'll be like uh, like giants had built it. Yeah, but well, he, he they knew th this is the kind of stature that the Eastern empires had because they were gargantuan. Whereas everything in the Greek is is very small and parochial, you know. In Greece, mm. like you know, the Wall of Athens is oh you know, look, they've got a six mile long wall that connects them to the sea. So like, oh wow, that's well, no, you're not even six miles, is it? Probably not even six miles, you know. And the, the Persians are like, well, our cities are eighteen miles across. Babylon's is probably the same, you know. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You've got nothing, you know. This is why these cities yeah. had great empires. Yeah, and 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 even though they're still that big, they're they're ruined, but they're still that big. Um, I, I think Dan Carlin says it's like that um scene in the Planet of the Apes, seeing the Statue of Liberty yeah. stick, sticking out of the sand. It's like. What is this like? Or, or there's there's a great bit in the 2001 a Space Odyssey when when he goes through the portal um, at the outer limits of the solar system and he's thrown through sort of intergalactic space and on the way he just sees loads of ancient space junk um, that, in, hmm. in other words, the massively more advanced futuristic civilization is actually fantastically old and ancient and long gone. Yeah. And yet, way more, way, way, way more advanced than but most that does your head in. But before, before modern times, almost every civilization thought they lived in an inferior present where the past was really good and the present was a lot worse. Right. All of them. Like, think about it. Like, um, you know, go, go to, like, you know, I mean, the Greeks thought, obviously, Troy, the gods, lived among them. They, they had a golden age and a silver age and an iron age or whatever it is. You know, and the, the sort of like the mythic cycles in their mythology. So they, they, and then you've got, I mean, like the Romans are probably the only people in the last 2000 years to think they didn't. And even then, they still had the inherited myth, but like they had, you know, broken new ground. But then you got like, you know, the Germans, when they arrive in, in Western Europe and like a few generations down the line after the Western Roman Empire's fallen, they're like, oh yeah, giants built these buildings, you know. And you mm -hmm. get all, you know, you've got all the mythic history. It's like, we're in the, we're at the first period of time really where we think that we're way superior to the people who came before us. Yeah. Weird, you know? Yeah, like a Frankish uh, or Lombard people seeing the, the, the ancient Roman aqueducts and thinking, well, yeah. surely godlike giants built this. This, <laughs> well, this isn't literally. the work of men. Yeah, and, and like all the megalithic structures, people assume that like giants built them and stuff. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it assumes like a greater past. Yeah, there's there's one bit up when they're up in the mountains. It's like these little things, these little details that like we said earlier, where it just um, it, it just hints at something or just says it in passing. You're like, what was that? What could that possibly yeah. have been? That like there's one bit where he says they they come across um, uh, uh, some people that have got a load of beehives and they make <laughs> they make loads of honey. And the people mm. that uh, anyone in there in the Greek army that had any, it sent them mad. Um, <laughs> Like if you had a little yes. bit, just a little bit, you acted like you were a bit high or drunk. But if you had like, any real amount at all, like it almost 
zoned you out, knocked you out, and you were like completely delirious and and just this weird thing. It's like, what what are you talking about there? What is that? You know, honey doesn't do that or shouldn't do. Like, what's going on? And well, you I mean, get maybe, no explanation. Well, they they, well, they didn't have one, do you? But like this this is it. It sounds very sort of much like the Odyssey, doesn't it? You know, where it's um traveling through a strange land with no explanation as to why it's the the way the strange way that it is um but yeah they i, I always assumed that it was some sort of um you know some sort of drug that they'd put in it yeah well i, I suppose so it, it just it just on the face of it doesn't make sense but um no. you know that that's the account he gives and um well it's great for historians just to argue about and talk about if nothing yeah. else <laughs> endlessly yeah, yeah, really yeah. But I, you know, I, there's no reason to think that something strange didn't happen. I mean, the, you got stuff like that with the exploration of the new world and stuff like this. You know, if you read some of the accounts, you get just strange little things that happen that can't really be explained. But you're sure the thing happened because why would he write that down otherwise? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, it gets to as we said before these cycles of, of darkness and light and 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 just sort of I suppose like in real life in mountain ranges you sort of usually come out of them very quickly you come out into a nice bright uh, sort of plain type mm. area and you you leave the sort of foreboding nature of, of of mountainous areas behind you quite quickly and you come out into sort of an open uh, nice area and um, I mean this is no different but they they don't have much of a respite they think that there's a classic bit where he, he sort of gives the impression that everything's going to be okay. We're on the other side of sort of the Armenian mountains now. Everything's yeah. going to be fine, and and the men are happy, and they have some food that day and everything. And then they realise, oh no, the the peoples on this side of the mountain uh, are, are are sort of <laughs> ranging against us. We're seeing what's that on the other side of that river? We're seeing ugh, uh, cavalry formations and uh, infantry formations. Oh shit! It's nothing. Well, nothing's over. The, this this is the thing, isn't it? Because now they're actually, I get, I te- I'd say technically they're probably out of the Persian Empire at this point, um, and I'm sure that they had the sense of leaving the Persian Empire, but then they start entering, I- encountering tribes who want to fight with them, don't they? Yeah, yeah. He never explicitly says a point where, um, like, uh, uh, Tissaphernes was not following us anymore. Um, again, that was something. If you're reading a, a, a Dan Brown or something. Mm. Um, it, they explicit. would definitely say that, <laughs> yeah. but it's n- at no point does he say, "Oh, we're not being followed by the Persian, like the the grand." Well, the army. Persians don't really come up after this point, do they? No, they don't particularly follow them into the mountains at all, because um, though apparently those those mountain peoples were They're not had, hadn't yeah. been subdued, so they wouldn't be. Yeah. Um. You, you know, it'd be just as hard for the Persian army, almost hard going. Yeah. So yeah, oh, yeah, it'd be essentially fresh territory. <laughs> this is this is what I mean when the the Greeks found the Persian Empire empty. I think they were expecting this, you know, where it'd be like, like you know, lots of small tribes, but lots of them that would band together to form a coalition and come and attack them, you know. So like, pa- they'd have to pacify an area before moving through it, um, and they didn't have to do that going into the Persian Empire. Yeah. Um... Uh, what, what, sorry, what point are we in the narrative here? I just got my book. Sorry. Heading, heading towards the Black Sea. Heading, heading towards the sea. Yeah. Well, I mean, that yes. is again one of the great set pieces of the yep. of the thing. When um, I mean, I don't know if you want to explain it, but like the front of the army. Yeah, sort of it's re- it's genuinely uh, it, like it's elating when you're reading through it. And again, he's not really he's he's just telling you what the what it seemed that from his point of view at the time. Um, but he's just telling you what happened. But I love the way that, like, the cry sort of snakes back from the front of the army to Xenophon of people chanting "the sea, the sea," because they yeah, can finally see yeah. the Black Sea as they come along. And because uh, the Greeks, being a seafaring people, you know, they're all little frogs around a pond. You know, yeah. they, they're very, you know, they're, they're, the sea is a, a part of their life. And so when they finally see it after months of being inland, sort of thing, it's you know they're thrilled and it's it's elating genuinely uplifting it's it's such a great um point but then it's that it's from this point onwards shit starts going wrong mm, it gets much more complicated doesn't it from yeah, it that does. point on but but yeah that cry of the sea the sea is sort of a sort of a famous line if you if you study mm-hmm. ancient history it's sort of, you know a famous one but um yeah and it's great i mean even when i was a kid you know going to the seaside the first time you catch a glimpse of a overcast the grey seas at like Lyme Regis or something, it's still great. <laughs> so to actually um, have come through a, a harrowing, <laughs> a harrowing yeah. ordeal like they've done, uh, it would have been, well, you would have thought that you've made it or at least the worst is behind you. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and like the front of the art, well, well, 
as we've said, Xenophon is in the rear guard nearly all the time. And when the front of the army crests this last hill or this last peak, um, and they can see the sea, they just hear a shout, and and the rear guard and Xenophon and all his men think that that they've been they engaged. Rushing up, yeah. yeah, they think maybe there's they've been ambushed. The, the vanguard's been ambushed or something. Um, but of course, they realise happily that it is just just the sea, and they're all they're all overjoyed. And and yeah, it's a great moment. You do sort of share share that moment with them because the last few pages the last couple of chapters or whatever been so dark so just yeah. like endless snow and cold and dead yeah, yeah. Or whatever. <laughs> hostile tribes and and people you know, like catastrophes and it's like jesus you know it's, it's nice that so, you know something good comes for them yeah and and so th- i've heard it said that at this point it would have been um not a terrible place to bring the narrative to a close um and 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 uh, it, it does sort of feel like that in a way that would have that wouldn't have been a terrible place to sort of end it there as, as effectively they were safe although we realize we find out they're not but um if they were or if they weren't just uh, uh you know that they went into the heart of, of 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 asia you know and and they got out um even if they're still a long way from the peloponnese that they're on the black sea um you know the eastern bit of the black sea but most of their troubles could be should be over yeah and i've i've heard historians say that why exactly wasn't it ended there because when you do read to the end and you find out that where he does decide to end it it's a bit of a weird place where he ends it and you're like what, okay what well points the end? well i i remember what happens after this point but how does it end again so the end is well well there's a whole bunch of uh, back and forth but in the end he hands out. He tries to get, Xenophon himself tries to sort of get away from the army a few yeah. times, and in the end, it's handed over to a a, a Spartan general called Thibron, who sort of comes out of nowhere. He's sort of mentioned like one one chapter before that yeah. there's a a grand new elected Spartan general going to come over from Greece and take control of the army that which is up in uh, Thrace at this point, mm. and they've crossed over into Thrace by that. Yeah, 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 and he just I, gives I, I... it. He just give he hands it over and like the exact details of that aren't given, so we don't know exactly how that went down. But it's mm. given to Thibron. Thibron, we're given to understand, is to march them back into Asia uh, on a new campaign, and 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 we're given to understand that Xenophon's gonna go home back to Athens, but he doesn't say he does. It ends with him just going, uh, "Yeah, we handed the army over to Thibron, and uh, and and uh, I was free to go home, and that's it." And doesn't doesn't show that at all. Well, I, I think I think it's interesting that he doesn't end up seeing the sea because what what you notice then is that essentially they're in familiar territory and they get sucked right back into the politics of the, the area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's it's very interesting how you know they're still a political entity when they're in the Persian Empire, but they're like like a, a blob of oil in a sea of water, you know? <laughs> Mm. That's how that's how it felt when they're walking through it, you know. So there's something separate and distinct to the Persians. But as soon as they get back to the sort of local area, they see uh, Trebizond, is it on the on the sea, and they yeah. start negotiating with them, and then they uh, they end up travelling over to Thrace and then allying with the tribe and splitting up because they start having disputes within the in the ranks and like you know three thousand go this way and four thousand go that way or something like that. And then they get was it they get trapped on a hill and surrounded by Thracians, and the the other group come and save them from that, don't they? Yeah, that's right. Xenophon comes to the rescue, to the relief of one of that's the other right. detachments after they break up. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, like the, the whole period after they come to the sea and you're exactly right. They just immediately <laughs> get yeah. get drawn into the politics of it. And and where their, where their uh, cohesion or their uh, discipline had been uh, unshakable, really, on the march yeah. through the mountains and everything suddenly becomes a bit more a bit yeah. weaker. And suddenly people there are options going off doing pillaging things they really shouldn't yeah. and that sort of thing. But that's the thing. Suddenly there are options, you know, say, well, if I leave now, I can just run away to this village or, you know, I I could, you know, side with this king or, you know, city or whatever it is, you know, suddenly they're in a world of political decisions. Yeah, yeah. Or like, you know, one of the big things, one of the big sort of turning points, deciding points they have to make their mind up on is whether they should get some, try and get ships or build ships or pay for ships and just just go back to the the Aegean theatre uh, that way whether they need to go across land and it's tough but eventually it's sort of more of a, yeah. a land issue and um and yeah and whether the Greek cities or towns or just um just the different areas they have to pass through whether they're um kind to them or not and mm-hmm. 
all, all the different again xenophon sort of personally talks around quite a few different <laughs> chieftain type peoples um because he's great at giving speeches um the, <laughs> the, the further through the the further through the anabasis you get the more xenophon's giving speeches and and towards True. the end uh, one of the last the penultimate chapter last chapter it's mostly him sort of defending himself in in speech in his own speech mm. uh, and it, it, it becomes it, it becomes clear that it, what started off as uh, apparently a a straightforward historical account turned into some sort of semi-autobiographical um uh, novella style thing uh, yeah. it turns into just a pure almost a pure defense because in the text he's defending himself from his enemies and detractors within the army and on the march but yeah. he's actually speaking to the athenian he's persuading the reader this text is meant for yeah and he's defending himself in the more general sense you know so he's doing yeah. two things at once yeah it's so charges of not giving sufficient pay to the soldiers and things like this yeah lots of different charges um and uh, of, of not doing the right thing at certain times and withholding money and not being honorable and and yeah, multiple different things, and he, mm-hmm. he just defends himself against them all. Um, at some at one point in the penultimate chapter, he he uh, he, he makes three speeches one after the other. It's <laughs> basically the same thing, just yeah. saying, you know, "Poor old Xenophon never did nobody no harm." <laughs> well, uh, what did he do wrong by his own account? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go back and read my own account. You'll see I did yeah. nothing wrong. Yeah, exactly. See, sign Xenophon. I trust him. <laughs> But uh, it's it, it I you know, who knows how reliable anything that we've got that this old is. But um, mm. even even if it's not the most reliable account, uh, which I'm sure it's not, it, it is definitely the most entertaining account of almost anything. Really, it's it's totally it's worth your read. time to read. It's totally worth it, it. It's a great read, and it's quite accessible because some of the others are not. Uh, I mean, Thucydides is quite. He's not accessible. It yeah. is, yeah, yeah, and and this is quite accessible. He speaks in pretty normal language. It depends what translation you read, but he says, yeah, yeah he uses pretty normal language. Like, there's even even though he's supposed to be a detached and a good historian speaking about himself in the third person, a fair few times he does just say I, like he say things like, "Oh, do you remember that yeah. thing I wrote just now?" Actually, what I meant was, and and that sort of thing. So you do get you do get these personal little touches, and it's nice. Mm. It's an easy read. It's not too long either. It's uh, no, no, you know, it's, it's very manageable. Like I, I, I just, I just got on Audible actually to because I'm going to listen to it again because I haven't listened to it in a few years, and uh, it's only seven hours long. So like you know, if you're sat in your office or something, this is what I used to do when I was working in boring jobs. I hated. I just sit there with audiobooks, and th- I, I watched this one on YouTube because it was free. Um, but I've, I've got the Audible one because it's done by a guy called Charlton Griffin, who I've listened to many, many, many hours of him reading things like Harold Lamb um, and stuff like that. And he's got a very, very good voice for this kind of thing. So totally recommended. Yeah. And I'm not being paid for that. <laughs> I, had to, I had to pay for the damn thing, you know, but um, totally worth yeah, it. Yeah, and it's, it's, there's, there's a bit in uh, Good Will Hunting where um, him and Robin Williams, they say something about what are the right books or something like what books are good and, and you know, well, what are the right books? Well, this is one of the right books. You know, if you're going to read something to give you a good perspective on yeah. the ancient world and set you up for really uh, understanding all, all different things about the nature of, uh, of about the nature of humans and war and um, and writing stories and all that sort of thing, you could just you can do a lot worse. Oh God, this is one of the best. This is, I mean, there there have been numerous. Um, movies that have been not adaptations of this, but um, based on the the framework of the story that's told has been lifted and applied to like the Warriors and stuff like this. So the, the film from the seventies. Really? Is that? By, I, oh I yeah, didn't yeah. Know that. yeah, 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 yeah. I will rewatch Warriors with that in mind. I, yeah. I did not know that. Huh. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. The novel um, and the film. Um, yeah, no, totally and. But this is the thing, like, it's it's a shame, like, for, for like, anyone who's got a, a, a love of the time period, that there's not, like, a big, um, you know, good budget and well-produced, um, like, epic of it, like, a modern epic of it. It's a real shame. Yeah, but... no, yeah, that really is this point, because it could be, yeah, I, I think it could be... Because Xenophon's a young guy, like you say, you can get some famous, you know, Hollywood actor doing it. Yeah, he's supposed to be 30, he clearly says he's yeah. the youngest of the generals of the Stratagoy. 
But yeah, no, it's it's genuinely excellent, and it's totally worth your time. And I hope we've done it justice. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah, um, of course it goes. There's a there's a fair bit towards the second half of the book where, that we'll, we'll we'll leave uh, people to find out for themselves. Um, yeah, it it gets quite complicated with the um uh, the the political Byzantium. machinations. Yeah, yeah, whole, um, whole bit with Byzantium and stuff. But um, yeah, yeah. I'll t- remind me what happens in Byzantium. I can't remember that offhand. Well, eventually they he they 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 take it. Um, <laughs> oh, that's sort of, right. Yeah, they end up basically taking it, and it yeah. gets it gets really messy because some Lacedaemonians, some some Spartans turn up and sort of try and take command, and yeah. and Xenophon realizes that he might be in danger from his own men, even, and that he tries to escape by by boat like two or three times, and is ordered not to, and it gets kind of complicated. It's actually one of the periods in the book where it's not that easy to keep track of exactly what's going on or i yeah know, but, are, are you sure it's byzantium yeah oh yeah yeah uh, they, i know they take i know they take something i didn't i thought it was... they take all sorts up in thrace they, they yeah a great deal goes on there um yeah yeah no there's a whole bit um the taking of byzantium i don't remember that but offhand. i know i knew they took something yeah. let me i i see this is why i'm gonna have to book reread it i can't remember that byzantium uh, that's that's right book seven was it yeah yeah Oh yeah, because they're in the chest knees. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm reading through the notes on Wikipedia now. But it's towards the end. I mean, by this yeah. point in the narrative, um, uh, Xenophon. Well, it's clear that the 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 homecoming is not going to happen for the yeah. army. The army aren't interested in that. Xenophon is the character of Xenophon is really interested in still getting home to sort of beloved Athens. But the rest of the army, they're, they're mercenaries. they It seems like the, the the idea of coming home is less important than than making money and uh, winning honor. Um, and well, so they're home the, now, basically, aren't they? Well, yeah, I this is where so, they yeah. came from, probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they they yeah. were they they were campaigning around this area for Cyrus, like they're back to yeah. where they started. Yeah, right. So I mean, where it becomes again this this sort of the two narrative strands mm. of of the the fate of the army of the ten thousand and the fate of Xenophon himself. Yeah, um, so I, and, I can't and, remember the complexities of the politics offhand because the narrative becomes very. Like diluted because suddenly oh. it, you're back into the you know, the complex world of Greek power politics. Yeah, so. where they're mentioning loads of tribes and loads of different names, and, you're and you don't know who the fuck they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it does get a bit murky, a bit a bit messy. Yeah, in yeah. Sort of the last third of it, sure, but um, but yeah, great read nonetheless. Definitely, um, but the you know it was obviously an audience that were expected to know who the hell he was talking about. You know, like celebrities, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it talks about a guy, Suthis, who's sort of the yeah. king up there. And it's like you, you, you're pretty much expected to know off the bat. If not yeah. who he is, you would have just heard of him for sure, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, we yeah. have, you know, a modern reader wouldn't have done. But, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you can hardly blame him for that, I suppose. But yeah, so I definitely, definitely recommend it. Is there any, okay. anything, any, any particular interesting things that we missed out? Um. Uh, well, loads. Give me one of the examples. One of the interesting things that we missed to end on. Well, what about the idea that that um the idea that Xenophon has deliberately taken the sort of mold of the Odyssey, mm. and people have said that he's like just deliberately made up whole bits just so it mirrors the Odyssey. So, for example, there's a bit in the Odyssey when when Odysseus gets right close to Ithaca and the wind blows him back, and he's like literally mm-hmm. in sight of of Ithaca. And it blows him back, and there's a bit towards the end of what well, plays out, does it two or three times in in the Anabasis, where they say he's pretty much he's right on the cusp. He's pretty much saying, "I'm going to leave immediately. I'm going to head for a ship immediately." And something happens, sort of effectively, blow him back from from being home bound. And um, some people, a fair few people, have said that that that's probably bullshit. <laughs> mm. um, like, well, I'm I'm a fan. I, I I'm a fan. I think it's it's. A, a great story and i don't think he's probably made a, i think it's rosy tinted in places but not much Obviously, more than yeah. that but some yeah. people really rip him uh, like there's a, a german uh historian from sort of the turn of the century called Niebuhr, who says uh he said this quote truly no state has ever exiled a more degenerate son than this xenophon plato <laughs> <laughs> plato was not a citizen either he was not worthy of athens he took incomprehensible steps he stands like a sinner against the saints, Thucydides and Demosthenes, but still differently from this old fool, meaning Xenophon. How abhorrent is he with his prattling and his lisping naivete of a little girl? 
my god like that that is german to the core <laughs> like, that is so unforgiving yeah right <laughs> like, like i didn't i didn't think that at all like no but, but that's they, not the yeah. impression i got from this at all like, that is well somebody he just got used him as just a liar i don't think simple as that right but. okay i i'm sure he's not just a liar i've like i <laughs> that's totally unfair <laughs> Yeah, no, right, I, well, I'll, I'll let you well, go, but um, it's all right if I, you know, put this on my channel like before. Yeah, of or... course, man, of course. Right. You know, um, hey, hey, what do you want to do next? Oh, I, I was hoping you would ask. I'd love to do <laughs> Alexander. I'm. Uh, oh yeah, uh, let's do Alexander. Uh, man. What what text do you want to do? I, I'm an Aryan fan myself. Um, right. So okay. That because I, I I've, I'm going to be honest with Alexander. I've only ever read like um uh you know like professional historians talking about him. Right. I've not read the original. Um, well, so I'll, yeah, you can, sorry, I'll you can get, get Arian as a, a penguin paperback. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, 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 I'll be able to find it, um, but I'll, I'll get it and and read it for the next time we do this. This is no, seriously, I, I love these conversations. This is great fun. So I'm yeah. totally, totally happy to be doing them. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I read um, Arian's account of Alexander. But this, this is <laughs> totally worth my time. So, oh, cheers, man. Well, I, I'll be in touch. Uh, thanks again. Yeah, man. Take it easy. All right, cheers.